Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Like pseudo. <laughs> Call the meeting to order. I'll ask Steve uh, Carter to do the invocation and the pledge. Join me if you will in prayer, please. Father God, as we gather here this morning, dear Lord, to do the business of the citizens of Alamance County, we seek and desire your presence your guidance, your will be done in the actions of our board, dear Father. We ask that you be with us, be with the words that we say, the thoughts that we have. Prepare us, dear Lord, for the work of Alamance County. We ask that you keep us safe and sound and healthy, that you be with those struggling with the COVID virus and other issues in our community and that you help us overcome all of these evils that are in our world dear lord we ask all of these things dear lord in the powerful and holy name of our your son our savior jesus christ amen, amen. join me in the pledge i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god Indivisible, the next thing on the agenda is truly an honor. Well, it's that gentleman sitting uh, second row, uh, Alamance row. County Mask. <laughs> Mr. Turner, if you would approach. And you have someone here to swear you in. The clerk of court, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mayor Phillips. And good to see you as well. Good Thank morning, you. Mr. Paisley. Okay, slip around to the other side. Sorry. Um, I'll stand here. <laughs> I don't want to get in here. Okay. We could ditch the microphone somehow. <laughs> that works. Thank you. Oath of Alamance County Commissioner. I can state your name. I, William Craig Turner Jr. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support. And maintain. And maintain. The Constitution. The Constitution. And laws and laws of the United States of the United States and the Constitution and the Constitution and laws and laws of North Carolina of North Carolina not inconsistent therewith not inconsistent therewith and that I will faithfully and that I will faithfully discharge discharge the duties of my office the duties of my office as county commissioner as county commissioner for the county of Alamance for the county of Alamance so help me God so help me God I. I, William Craig Turner Jr. Do swear. Do swear. That I will well and truly. That I will well and truly. Execute. Execute. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. Of county commissioner. Of county commissioner. For the county of Alamance. For the county of Alamance. According to the best of my skill and ability. According to the best of my skill and ability. According to law. According to law. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. <laughs> And if you would join us, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chief. <laughs> Madam Clerk, Miss Edwards, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Turner, do you have any words you would like to say? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do have a few words. I'll be brief. 
When I was a plebe at the Naval Academy my first day, it, it became readily apparent that there was going to be a ton of information I'd have to memorize. Some of it was trivial, like the menu for noon meal. Some of it was functional, like rank structure. Some of it was critical to what we were doing uh, and to who we were, like the mission of the United States Naval Academy. I think that mission has applicability here today. I'll paraphrase it. It's to develop midshipmen morally, mentally, and physically, and to imbue them with the highest ideals of duty, honor, and loyalty. So part of the mission is to imbue in midshipmen high ideals, duty, honor, and loyalty, not for the sake of having them, but for the sake of showing them uh, and applying them to your naval service. And then, it's part of the mission, to apply them afterwards uh, when you assume, if you assume, the highest responsibilities of command, citizenship, and government. Um, and I think those ideals hold true, certainly with my approach to this office. I, I just took a solemn oath to support and defend the, the Constitution and the North Carolina Constitution. That is a solemn duty, one that we, I do not take lightly, and I know the members of this board do not take lightly and I will carry that through the service to this board. Honor is how we do the work that we do. We do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. We do what we say we're going to do. That is a characteristic I'd like to bring to my service to this board. And finally, loyalty. Uh, in the Navy, loyalty is easy. Uh, you're loyal to your ship, your shipmate, your shipmates and yourself in that order. Um, you're all together accomplishing the same mission. I think loyalty in the context of government service might be a little harder. Um, certainly your loyalty to the county, your loyalty to the, to the citizens of the county, but we're not all going to agree. Citizens of the county are diverse, come from multiple backgrounds. Uh, I certainly have a political perspective that is conservative in nature. Um, but I think showing loyalty in this role to the members of the community is showing respect to everyone regardless of viewpoint and background. It's disagreeing in a civil way. It is engaging each other with civil discourse when we disagree. Um, we're going to disagree. Uh, we live in polarizing times. But I think, for me, applying these ideals to this office uh, will allow, perhaps, us to do community a little bit better together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We look forward to working with you and serving with you. That's good. Uh, I would warn the audience, uh, both of us guys are attorneys and both of us guys are juniors. I'm not sure what that says. <laughs> okay, Mr. Albright, I want to ask you, uh, over the uh, well Friday afternoon, um, I spoke to you about um, the litigation that we had been in previously particularly with the snow camp issue and uh, if you would tell this board what you told me on Friday. Well the litigation uh, continues in the form of a right to make appeal to Judge Lambeth's order dismissing the county from the lawsuit. That order was entered <clears throat> on July the, I'm sorry, January the 11th and the appeal time does not run until February the 10th. I not, have not had any indication that they intend to appeal, but certainly that is um, a possibility. So, it's would still, that have any, uh, would you direct us to uh, take action, not take action, to discuss, or to totally stay silent on that issue, uh, or matters regarding that issue, pending the, the appeal uh, period. I would suggest to the board, Mr. Chairman, that if you do want to discuss that case, we do so in closed session. All right. What about taking action that would uh, have an impact upon that matter? I would uh, um, advise the board not to, to, not to discuss the case or anything involving the case with the parties, uh, which are the named parties, Breedel, or anybody that is involved with the litigation All right. at least at least until the appeal time has run and there has been no appeal so if there's no appeal uh, carried out obviously entered 
uh, then at our next meeting we will be open to uh, do pretty much what we need to do at that point. Uh, that's correct, but th there's still a possibility of additional lawsuits. Um. All right. Thank you. Madam Clerk, um, do we have speakers? Uh, yes, we do have a couple in the call queue, and I have received some written uh, comments pertaining to the agenda. So if we could go ahead and um, take our agenda-related callers now. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might just for one moment. Uh, yes. It's a matter of full disclosure. My law firm does represent a defendant in that matter that you were discussing, that litigation matter. Uh, I have developed an ethical screen in my law firm with regard to that and have no uh, contact regarding that matter, no contact with any attorneys regarding that matter. Uh, and if the board were to consider a matter that's related to that, uh, I would have to um, look into it to see how appropriate it would be to, to comment or to make, uh, to, you know, to vote on a matter that was that, would, that might show the any possibility of a conflict of interest. All right. And I might indicate, um, and you probably already know this, uh, as a county commissioner, you're obligated to uh, take a vote on all issues unless uh, asked to be excused, recluse yourself from that vote, and the board um, board votes to allow you to do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good morning. You're connected to the county commissioners meeting. If you would state your name and begin your three minutes. Uh, let me let me uh, let me hold Good morning, off. Good morning, Commissioner. My name is uh, just, a, just, just a moment, Mr. Vines. Uh, let me remind everybody: you have three minutes. Uh, after the three minutes, we will we'll, we will be required uh, to terminate your your speech and so forth, and it must be something on the agenda in this segment. And Mr. Vines, thank you. Uh, please continue. You may start now, Mr. Vines. Good morning, Commissioners. This is Henry Vines. I uh, wanted to just thank everybody for being willing to serve as Commissioners. And I um, wanted to take this opportunity to speak to you about what's on the agenda about the land development as I served on you know, the steering committee. Uh, I think you'll see that in the presentation, and it's been in, the, in there, that uh, we have a strong consensus across the county to zone the whole county. I think that this is time that we need to zone the home county and I hope that y'all will vote today to implement this plan in a way that will go that way and put the wheels in motion to zone the whole county. I understand the concerns in the snow camp as you know a small area zoning plan but I think we need to be concerned about all of us, the citizens out here. I live less than five miles from the line that's being drawn to the zone. So, and we sit right there in my community. We have two uh, sand rock pits and two um, landfills, and one is closed within three miles of my house. So I just feel like it's very strongly that we need to implement zoning. It'll not only help residents know what they can expect when they move into an area, but our growth in our county uh, is such a, you know, it's growing so fast. And I know in the past I have worked with trying to get zoning for 30 years, and it has not been a popular uh, thing out here in the community. But I think more now than ever, people are are more willing and ready for zoning to happen in this county because of the impact of everything that's going. Ordinance are fine, but they're only a band-aid. Ordinance can be gotten around, and you know, even the best we can do, they can still meet these ordinances, and that doesn't protect citizens from you know being embarked upon and thinking they're safe but if you had zoning they know what their what their area entails and know what to expect and i would appreciate that uh, that you would look at that 
And if you consider as a momentarium on the count on the, the area, I hope that you will do it on the whole county, you know, to protect us all because uh, these things can move very rapidly right next door, even north. And uh, I would appreciate your consideration on that too, commissioners. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Vines. that the, the bill works. <laughs> okay, um, Mr. Chair, at this time we have no other callers in the queue for agenda. Oh, there's another one. No, there's three more. Oh, three more? Okay. You're connected to the county commissioner's meeting. Please state your name and begin your three minutes. Good morning and welcome new commissioners. Uh, my name is Ron Spinhoven and I am a snow camp resident. I'm calling in today to reiterate my support for the small area plan for snow camp. I spoke at the last commissioner's meeting prior to their vote on the plan last year. As you should be aware, due to a flawed permit process and unfortunate lack of oversight by the planning board and board of commissioners, a permit was issued to snow camp property investments, LLC, for an open pit blast mine in our quiet agricultural community. The permit was issued on the QT and without public notice or comment to a company of highly suspicious origins. Although some changes have been made to the permit process and the heavy industrial development ordinance, they clearly alone are not enough to protect and preserve the uniqueness of our snow camp community. Therefore, a small area plan for snow camp is necessary and as soon as possible. In the meantime, we are still vulnerable. Therefore, I am urgently asking for a motion and vote this morning to schedule a public hearing for the next commissioner's meeting on February 15th to discuss enacting a moratorium on any new permits in snow camp not in alignment with the small area plan until the plan is in place. This will give you more time over the next couple of weeks to review the land development plan in more detail and hopefully approve a moratorium. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Svenhoven. And Madam Clerk, I would ask that uh, all speakers, and I should have previously, give their full name and address, please. Okay. And if they have an unusual spelling, to spell it for us. All right. Oh, let's wait a sec. Good morning. You're connected to the county commissioner's meeting. If you would state your full name and address and then begin your three minute comment. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Thomas Hicks. I live at 1730 Quakenbush Road in Snow Camp, North Carolina. Uh, and I assume I'm addressing the commissioners at this point. Uh, I'm requesting that you uh, exercise your authority to implement a six month or longer moratorium for any permit requests that are not consistent with the proposed snow camp small area plan. Uh, at this time, there are two North Carolina mega sites that comprise over 3,300 acres that are already zoned for heavy industry within 15 miles of snow camp. And we will remain a target for industrialization that will transform the fabric of our, um, of our cherished rural and historic community. Uh, the Snow Camp Mine is just the start of what can happen to our community without protections from the disruption, noise, and infrastructure costs, air and water pollution that comes with heavy industry. On October 1st, 2018, we learned that our community was facing a challenge to our health and safety as a result of an intent to construct permit issued for this mine under a deficient hydro without the knowledge of the planning board, the commissioners, or the community. Our commissioners recognized the deficiency of this ordinance and recommended its revision, along with the need to look at land development plans that would provide a more reliable 
and less litigious protections for our communities. In the fall of 2019, our commissioners in initiated a comprehensive land development study that culminated in November of last year with the commissioner's acceptance of a recommendation of the planning board that includes a snow camp small area plan to address industries that are not in keeping with our rural agriculture and residential community. The moratorium would put on hold any permit requests that are not consistent with the guidelines for the snow camp small area plan. The proposed snow camp small area plan is a restriction on what types of developments are allowed in our community. It does not restrict our rights to enjoy our residential property and does not restrict farming operations. And it does not regulate grass mowing. It simply protects a way of life that we have come to love in snow camp. Several more steps that will include the involvement of our community are required before this plan can be implemented. The time required to complete these steps has been estimated at six months. Realizing that the new commissioners may need additional time to become familiar with the plan, you may wish to add, to add some additional time for your own review of the land development plan. I appreciate your consideration of my request to schedule the two necessary notifications uh, and a public hearing for the moratorium at the next regular commissioners meeting on February 15th, 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, there's another one. Yep, one more. Good morning. You're connected to the county commissioner's meeting. If you would state okay. your full name and your address and begin your three minutes after. Okay. My name, good morning. My name is Gary Lickney. I live at uh, 845 Soapstone Trail in Snow Camp. Uh, today you're going to hear about the recently approved land development plan, the smoke Snow Camp Small Area Plan that were developed to address inadequacies in our current land use plan and ordinances. At a recent meeting, I made comments urging you to put a moratorium on all intrusive polluting heavy industrial development in Snow Camp until the small area plan can be developed, allowing the citizens of Snow Camp to participate in developing a reasonable plan for future development that protects our safety, agriculture, and cultural heritage. You may ask why do we need a moratorium and I will remind you that a weak ordinance and vague land use procedures allowed an anonymous LLC registered in Wyoming to obtain a permit for a crust stone quarry with no input or knowledge of the affected citizens or the county commission. While the heavy industrial ordinance has been revised, even in its current form, it provides very little power to the citizens or commissioners to deny an application if the applicant is able to check all the application boxes. As commissioners, I would hope you're looking for quality companies with high integrity that provide good paying jobs to come to our county. Because of the veil of secrecy that these companies created, I've always suspected there was something to hide. If you Google the name C. Wayne McDonald, the person who signed the county application, you will see that several years ago he misled the city leaders of Lexington, North Carolina into changing the zoning designation of a property, telling them it was for an industrial park, when in fact, to their surprise, he had it permitted for a quarry. In addition, we have always suspected that the people behind the Snow Camp project had connections to the Bog Paving Company in Monroe, North Carolina. It turns out we were right. The person who signed the surety bond for the state mining permit as the owner of the mining company was Carl Drew Bog. In 2015, Mr. Boggs and several of his colleagues were convicted and sentenced to prison for defrauding, defrauding the federal and state government out of over $87 million by creating and billing for a shell minority company. Their company was also banned from any kind of bidding on federal or state contact, contract. Clearly, some people associated with the Snow Camp Project have put making money above obeying the law. Yet we in the community are supposed to trust them to follow strict procedures while blasting close to three hazardous fuel pipelines that run directly to the mining site. This is why we need a moratorium to give the citizens in the county time to step back and develop together a reasonably well thought out plan that protects our community 
and brings the kind of development and companies to Alamance County that we can be proud of. I strongly urge you to vote to hold a public hearing on the moratorium so you can hear the concerns of your constituents. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lutton. Okay. So at this time, Mr. Chair, we have received a set of written comments pertaining to an agenda item, the land development plan, and I will begin those right now. I'd and like a little bit of clarification there. We already have three. Um, obviously, we're limited to two, three on one topic. Okay. Uh, pursuant to our procedures. Uh, if these are continuing the same topic, <coughs> I do not, Mr. Albright, am I correct? We should not uh, consider those. You are correct. That is our procedure, Mr. Chairman. Now, his comments is about the land development plan, but he has a different opinion. Then I think it would be appropriate. Is that correct, Mr. Albright? An opinion opposite to what we've just heard? I would think that would be correct. All right, then proceed, please. Okay, these are from Steve Love, Major Hill Road, and Graham. I would like to express my reasons to be against countywide zoning. Number one, I am sure that the <coughs> individuals asking for zoning probably doesn't understand what zoning really means. Zoning is to put like businesses or developments together. Number two, I don't think that the county should be telling the citizens of Alamance County what they can or can't do with their land. Number three, there will be a cost to implement zoning, which means more tax expense. Number four, I know a lot of people that's against the snow camp rock quarry and I am only about four miles away and I don't zo think zoning now will stop the rock quarry. There's a rock quarry and an asphalt plant on Huffman Mill Road below ARMC, and I don't know of anyone complaining about that situation. I have more thoughts, but I don't want to exceed the 400 words. I couldn't catch the name, I'm sorry. Uh, that's from Steve Love of Major Hill Road in Graham. <clears throat> Thank you. Madam Clerk, are there others? That is it. All right. Thank you. I feel like I'm getting ready to go to a bank robbery. Mm -hmm. You've gone up and down <laughs> with the <a> mask. <laughs> Sheriff, you didn't hear that. <laughs> okay, Commissioner uh, responses. Hearing none, uh, we now have the agenda. Do I have a motion for approval of the agenda or any discussion? Mr. Chairman, I have a motion to make. I'd like to amend the agenda to include a closed session to discuss legal matters after the presentation by our director for planning. I'll second that. And I don't know that that has to do with the, well, I think that's good, okay. Uh, any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Is legal matters to turn on the uh, litigation of uh, is there a lawsuit you want to discuss? I'm sorry. You shouldn't. Uh, if, if there's a particular lawsuit you want to discuss, well, we're not in litigation right now. But there's a particular lawsuit you want to discuss. I'm not sure. That's not appropriate. You do need to name. Yeah, that's not that appropriate. No. Possession. Okay. Do we have a motion? To approve the consent agenda with that modification. Adam Motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Albright, is there a, should I have made the more detail in that motion? The requirement is if we're going to discuss a specific case, we must name the case. If you're just going to seek general legal advice, uh, then your motion is, okay. is appropriate. I think we're just seeking a general legal advice in this case. Um, Mr. Chairman, a while ago when you were um, speaking with Mr. Albright, you were talking about, um, it gave me the impression that we couldn't 
discuss a possible moratorium or any of that because of possible litigation or anything? Am I hearing that right or is that incorrect? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would defer to Mr. Holbright on, on that issue. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, as I understood the question, it was specifically related to the snow camp lawsuit. And it does not encompass uh, the reasons or rationales behind uh, whether or not this board is going to call for a public hearing to uh, issue a moratorium. So we can't even discuss the possibility of having a public hearing and a moratorium or scheduling that or anything like that? No, you can certainly discuss that. Okay. Uh, anything specific to the Rock Quarry lawsuit is what uh, <clears throat> I would suggest we not discuss. Okay, gotcha. Additionally, I would uh, request um, hold on one second. I would suggest before item four, that is the land development plan um, and the presentation of our planning director, that possibly the legal uh, going into executive uh, into uh, close session would be appropriate prior to number four. Is that agreeable? Would you like me to amend my motion to make the meet, uh, closed session prior to instead of after? If so, I'll, uh, yes. I'll amend let's, my motion to that. hold that closed session prior to the presentation. Does the second agree to that amendment? Sure. All right. Discussion? Why? See, y'all, I got law degrees. I don't, and you're talking way over my head, so you need to speak to something that I can understand. Because my point of view is it's getting stopped, <laughs> and I don't want it to be stopped, this discussion for these people that live out in snow camp. I simply would like to have legal advice before I make a move. Absolutely. I understand and respect that, but I just want to make sure this has gone on forever, and, um, and I think we need to talk about this in the most professional and legal way that we can, but um, we need to discuss this one way or the other. We need to discuss this. Well, I can assure you the purpose of my motion was I not to stop discussion. No, I didn't get that from you at all, Steve. Okay. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Van Deviser, I think you're up next. Should we join us by uh, Zoom commissioners. Grace, make sure you uh, unmute yourself. Good morning, commissioners. How are you? Good um, thank you very much. Um, the uh, Tourism Development Authority has an open board position due to the recent retirement of board member Carrie Worthy, Worthy uh, former director of Alameda Arts. Uh, we opened the application process to the public uh, in order to select the board member to fulfill his term, uh, which runs through August of 2022. Um, the process provided us two applicants, of which our uh, TDA board uh, went over those applicant applications and approved recommending Anderson Rathburn, who's the general manager of Burlington Baseball. Um, we would need the commissioner's approval to proceed with this appointment and fulfill that. And as I understand it, there are actually uh, two applicants. Correct. All right. And um, Joyce Davis. Uh, to Joyce Davis was the second applicant. She is the uh, owner of a local um, travel agency called Joy Cruises and Tour. All right. And commissioners, in your packet, you have uh, the information on both candidates. Mm -hmm. Do we need discussion, or is there a, a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve these two. No, we only have one. Okay, we well, just said two. Everybody was looking at me like. I'll make a motion that we approve Frank Bell. <laughs> Thank you. That's right. Hey. Frank Bell. No, no, no. No, this no. is the tourist. This is the tourist. I'll make a motion that we uh, approve Anderson Rothbaum. And I do note that that's who the uh, your board recommended. Yeah. Correct. Second. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Number seven. All right. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? I have just one item 
um, in uh, Mr. Rothbaum's uh, uh, application, he put down that he was not a resident. I called him, uh, and he in fact moved here, he said, on November the 1st, moved all of his worldly possessions, uh, and has lived here uh, prior to that date and continuously since that date. Um, the reason he, he told me that he put down that he was not a resident initially was that he had not sold his house yet in Florida. Uh, obviously, the attorneys here on this board and Mr. Albright know that's not a consideration of residency. If you move here and intend to be a resident uh, and move all your worldly possessions, that's a pretty good indicator that you, in fact, are a resident. So I found, to my satisfaction, that that was not an encumberment, uh, and I felt like he is qualified. You went beyond the consent agenda. Thank you. We vote on approving. We vote on the agenda, not the consent agenda. You're right. Okay, we'll come back to it. Thank you. Right. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Again, unanimous. Let me go back. Um, it was pointed out to me that I did not entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I thought that I had, but uh, but if I did or did not, that. either way, uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve. Second. All right. In discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Again, unanimous. Thank you. That's what confused me about Frank. <laughs> He's next on the agenda. Okay. Um, the second item on our agenda is of course uh, the COVID-19 update and Mr. Health Director. See, I pronounced it correctly this time. <laughs> 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 All righty, good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, Commissioners. Um, as always, I wanna thank, uh, thanks by, start off by thanking the men and women at the Health Department for all the work at the vaccination sites and the call center, um, just holding down the fort with the day-to-day -day operations, other county departments that are assisting, the Sheriff's Office, City, City of Burlington and their staff, all the volunteers that have come out to help at our vaccination clinics or in other um, areas of the vaccine. So, so much appreciated on behalf of the Health Department. Um, so before you up on the screen is a snapshot of our last case report. Uh, we reported as of last night, uh, 64 new cases. 45 of those cases are active in the hospital, 213 deaths. Out of those deaths, the majority come from 75 and up, um, and just below that between 60 and 74 years of age. Our weekly case average is 86 cases coming in a day. Um, two weeks ago when I was before you, um, it was 120 cases coming in a day. So we've seen um, a drop, and as you'll see on the two next screens, those drops are also indicated. Mm. Uh, this is a percent, the percent positive. So this is a test that are positive over total test in the county. And a rolling average, um, we dropped from, I think last, last time I was here, I reported 14.9%, and that has dropped to 11.3%. Um, this is consistent with also happening statewide. So hopefully that trend will continue. Um, this is our new cases over 14 days over per 1,000 population. That number is 1,012, and that's down from 1,069 when I last reported, or excuse me, 1,127 when I last reported before you uh, two weeks ago. This is our state outbreaks or what's reported by the state. Uh, eight nursing homes, eight residential care facilities, one congregant living, and then clusters, uh, three child care, and five K through 12 schools. All right, so if you're following the news, you've probably heard some news about the variant, um, the UK variant, also called B117. Um, it was recently found, uh, one, of the, one of the cases was recently found in Guilford County. Um, it is thought by the CDC this variant or these variants are likely more infectious, but not necessarily will make you more ill, but still a lot needs to be learned about these variants. It is unknown um, if, it, um, if it has any effect on the vaccine or no effect at all. So the CDC is continuing to study that. The South African variant, um, another type of variant that's out there, um, one of the cases was found in South Carolina last week. So I believe that was the first case in the United States that was seen. 
I ask there. a question, Mr. Director. Uh, is there is the present test that's being used in the county? Will it identify both the case the cases that are historic COVID cases versus the UK and the South African and any other variants? Will it break those out when we get our local citizens yeah. tested, Mr. Vice Chair? So the test itself will not. Um, distinguish between the variants what will happen is um, the test will have to go to the CDC and they're able to sequence the, the DNA or the, the virus itself and see if that is the variant that they're looking for so they basically do from my understanding a random sampling of the tests um, so they don't test they don't do a sequence on every test but they randomly sample to kind of get a picture of what's occurring throughout the United States so there could be more cases of the variants than we've had reported correct Okay, I understand. Tony, you. you were here last time. You had reported 200 deaths. 140 of those were out of rest home facilities. Since then, there's 13 extra deaths. Is um, do you have a number on how many of those 13 have been out of rest home facilities? Um, I did not. I did not. I did not look today to see how many were, but I can get you those, okay. those numbers. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Um, also in the news, um, some news about another vaccine that's coming about, possibly coming about, uh, from Johnson & Johnson. Um, some early data that came out in the news um, that Johnson & Johnson may apply for emergency youth authorization as early as this week. So best case scenario, we may see another vaccine in the marketplace um, in March. Um, from early reports, and again, the, the scientists still need to crunch the data from the CDC and the FDA, but uh, early results suggest that the vaccine, Johnson Johnson vaccine, is about 66% effective um, overall from their study. Um, it showed 72% effective just from their participants in the United States and 85% effective against severe illness of COVID. So those are very encouraging numbers. Um, so hopefully they'll, they'll put in their emergency youth authorization and go through the process and we'll have vaccine in the future. All right, so more on my vaccine, just to remind our, our mission here is shots in arms, safety and efficiency. Um, the state report by County of Residents shows that 10,491 residents in Alamance County have received their first dose and 2,259 have completed their series. That is as of 128. The Alamance County Health Department has been allocated 6,850 doses uh, to date and we have given 6,869 first doses with 2,183 completing the series. Again, we're giving more doses than we've been allocated um, for the wonderful job that our nurses are doing, um, drawing up those extra doses. We've been able to transfer 42 extra doses to North, yes sir. This is a, maybe a bad question. You know, on the TV news, and I'm not sure how much or how little you can pay attention to that. They're talking about shaking the vials down to get, can you explain that? Sure. So I don't know about the shaking the vials piece of it, but really we're, we're, we're getting the bang for our buck is um, the nurses love these specialized knee, um, syringes that they use and these syringes actually eliminate the dead space at the tip of the needle. Um, that's why they have been so, as well as their experience, I got to throw in their experience, very experienced season nurses that we use to draw off this vaccine. Um, so that has contributed to our success in being able to get those extra doses out of the vials. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Um, we've been able to transfer 42 extra doses to North Village Pharmacy, who is a approved vaccine provider. Um, and they are going out to some of the smaller group homes and vaccinating uh, the residents uh, in those group homes um, since we necessarily can't bring them in onto the site due to mobi mobility challenges. Um, this week we'll be receiving 975 baseline allocation. That 975 is our guaranteed minimum allocation for the next three weeks from the state. We're also receiving 200 additional doses from the state this week. Um, we may get 200 doses next week additionally. We may get more, we may get less, but at least at baseline, we're guaranteed 975 for the next three weeks from the state. That's each week. That's each week, yes Thank sir. You. Yeah, and usually we receive those shipments on Tuesdays or Wednesdays, typically on a Tuesday, we have them, we have them in hand. Okay, we're, we're still vaccinating groups one and two, which are healthcare workers and older adults. Um, we're continuing with the 75 and older. 
I will, um, based on what I'm about to explain, um, I think it's reasonable for us to look again this Friday and there's a good possibility we'll be ready to move um, that number down to 65 into next week. Reason being, some of the metrics looking at to inform that decision is first and foremost, as I mentioned, the state um, state report of Alamance County residents that are receiving um, their vaccinations, which was 10,491, and that was as of 128. Looking at the amount of doses that we're distributing into the community. I'm also looking at the chart right there with the yellow lines kind of in the middle um, of how many registered providers are being approved by the state to become vaccine uh, to be able to give the vaccine now this does not necessarily mean that there's enough in supply for them to have vaccine right now but what this does mean is when we have extra supply it gives us the ability to transfer to them so they can assist us in getting those um, shots in arms um, so it was very promising last week that we had four additional um, providers come online are we able to now give vaccines to teachers was that I heard some conversation about that a couple of weeks ago. Are we giving vaccines to the teachers? So we are not. So teachers will be in group three, which will be the next group when the state decides to move the down to the next group. There have been reports of um, two or three counties that um, started giving them to teachers, um, primarily because they had to expend their vaccine. So you got to a point it was either waste it, get it off your shelves, or give it to somebody and they then that's where they made the decision to go ahead and give it to teachers we haven't found ourselves in that situation as soon as we're giving it we're getting it off the shelf and getting in somebody's arm so our demand is still through the roof there's we we saw news i think in yesterday's or this morning's paper that cone is going to start receiving their vaccine again now are they just giving vaccine to healthcare workers or are they giving vaccine to other citizens as well? So, so both, um, they, they're continuing to give the healthcare workers and other citizens. Um, Cone's allocation for uh, baseline allocation is 2,925, but that's for all of the Cone's system, not specific to one's hospital. I will say Guilford County um, is, was given 7,725. From what I read in the paper, they were gonna share some of that with Cone. Um, and, and I'm sure there's going to be some Alamance residents that go over to Guilford or right. participate that and are able to get vaccinated. And so that's one of the things I'm watching on that bottom graph there is the allocations eight weeks, not only for Alamance, but Guilford County and some of the other counties um, with the idea that they will go to other counties to get their vaccine and we'll hopefully see that number increase. Additionally, Piedmont Health Services has locations that will be receiving 500 doses of vaccine. Um, uh, either as baseline or extra allocation this week too. So some more providers that are coming in Alamance County to help give the shots. Well, I think that's one thing we want to make sure our citizens are aware of too. They don't have to just get the vaccine in Alamance County if they live in Alamance County. It's a federal vaccine. They can literally go out of state if they want to, to get the vaccine if they find it's available someplace else. Yes, sir. That's correct. All right, vaccine looking forward. Um, we're going to continue to evaluate our need for medical personnel and operations. Again, that gives us the ability to expand and contract um, and making sure we have the appropriate staff to be able to staff our vaccine events. So we're always asking vaccine for, for volunteers that are able, that are licensed or certified to be able to give the vaccine um, and we'll put them on the list and get them scheduled um, as, as holes open up. Um, we are looking to move towards first dose operations into an, a large indoor space um, to come out of the element, elements and also improve efficiency um, with delivering the vaccine. I continue to advocate, as we just talked about, for providers in the community that are able to please enroll with the uh, state. Um, so the more providers we have giving vaccinations, the quicker we can get through our citizens um, to get them vaccinated. We're also looking at developing a partnership with Cone. I have set three expectations for this partnership to develop. Number one, we have to have the ability to get more shots and arms as we develop this plan with our partners. The process has to be efficient and integrated. So what that means, we're gonna look for efficiencies, especially with sharing staff and integrated, meaning if you're Mr. or Mrs. Smith and you're coming to get your vaccine, you're really, it's gonna seem seamless. You're really not gonna know if it was a health department 
employee that gave you that shot or went that helped you through the process or a, health, or a hospital employee that helped you through the process and gave you that shot. We are gonna give top-notch customer service and you're gonna leave there happy. So that's the second expectation of that process. And then the third one is targeted communications and outreach to our historically marginalized populations and making sure they have access to getting the vaccine. So those are my expectations of our partnership. We started uh, two weeks ago, started scheduling for second doses on site. So after you get your first dose, you're leaving with an appointment for your second dose. Um, and hopefully that will um, help reduce any type of missed appointments um, for folks that will have that in hand and be ready to go at their 21 or 28 day mark. And then the last piece I have to talk about, or really, um, really turn over to Bruce, is the technology uh, integration piece for um, scheduling and so on and so forth. Chair Paisley asked me to just kind of do an overview of what we've been doing for technology and what the next steps were going to be. So, you know, three weeks, all hands on deck. Uh, been really focused on helping the health department get whatever they need as fast as possible, efficient, keeping it simple, safe, and secure. We had all the hardware needs and the internet access at these sites. Um, got that up in record time, ordered the equipment, the tablets, and everything, got it connected to the state. Um, high volume call center that can handle an incredible amount of calls. It was the ultimate test for the call center. It did not crash, so we're very happy about that. <laughs> um, you know, there's still been incredible, you know, you've seen the numbers have been going out, the, the numbers have been really high, but they've been steadily going down. I sure, I'm sure they'll go up once we go 65 and older and that kind of thing. But, uh, um, and then developing the vaccine management scheduling program in-house, they, they took uh, what they've done for, uh, vaccine testing that they already developed that they had developed over time and kind of tweaked it actually every day sometimes hourly to get it straight uh to work with um, the health department of course it direct it uh downloads into the state system so our programmers worked as a matter of fact last night i got something at 11 o'clock last night they're still working on it i mean they're working uh, on it and everything so they went from paper to spreadsheets to adapting the program uh and again, they were in the call center the whole time, adapting it almost on the fly. Uh, we got the first dose, then we got the scheduled do second dose in there. And like he said two weeks ago, on site, while they're sitting there, they were able to get that second dose scheduled right away and in the system and in the state system. Um, there's a confirmation email that's been sent out to folks when they get it. And again, normally when you do something like this, it takes even if you've got all hands on deck, six months to get something like this going. And so we've been doing it in just a few weeks. Uh, and then we did it with a few weeks with no crashes. So that's a testament to my guys. They're working so hard late nights. Two of them had COVID during this time and they worked through COVID. They were ill. So God bless them. Um, mm -hmm. The next step. So we've been talking about and looking and talking with the state and some other folks and partners about, you know, possibly doing online uh scheduling you know so we're looking for something that has to be safe protecting our most vulnerable citizens you know they're the ones that get hacked and you know they're the targeted ones and so we want to make sure it's safe and hipaa compliant can handle the, you know intense demand you know the few folks that i've talked to out this, in the state that have successfully done it you know it goes up for like a half an hour it goes back down you know because it fills so quickly and of course you have to do some with phone some with online so we're looking at that and again, it has to integrate with our system that we 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 really value that data to make sure it's correct, um, and then uh, it has to work with the state system as well. And it's got to be simple, like he said, it's got to be efficient and simple for our citizens. So again, every week I'm on multiple calls with the state um, IT folks. We've heard of some real, you know, problems with some folks. Everybody's in the same boat. We were kind of told that this would be handled elsewhere and then it was kind of dumped on the counties and the local folks to try to handle and i mean my guys have really stepped up and done a great job and worked with the health department as best they can so whatever we do we'll have to be hybrid you know online and still doing on calls because you know as we talked about before a lot of folks in the county don't have internet access and some are technology challenged you know that kind of thing so they're still going to be calling in and that kind of stuff and again it doesn't solve the problem of supply and demand <laughs> you know but again, I'm very proud of the folks um, working on this. If you guys, if you guys have been out to the site, you see how hard they're working out in the mm -hmm. cold, their fingers are cold and stuff like that. You know, we're all here to try to step up. I mean, 
help our friends and neighbors and I'm really it's been inspiring for me just to, it's one of those fundamental good things that we're doing and we're uh, we're, we're, we're doing pretty well so um, does anybody have any questions on the technology part just one a comment I'd like to make I had uh, first of all I did visit and uh, watch what was going on and it is it is really amazing to see the number of volunteers we have not only our health department employees but county employees municipal employees other volunteers coming out to help make sure we get our citizens taken care of but I want to say too that I wish I had thought to share it with you I shared it with Mr. Lojou Dejay and didn't share it with you I had several people contact me early on in the process that were frustrated by the amount of online or on the phone waiting time and then finding out they weren't going to get an appointment well I've gotten subsequent calls and contacts and text messages from some of those people that have praised the new process and how smoothly it seems to be working and they're very very uh, confident that the health department and and the county is trying to take care of them so thank you both very much for what your, your hard work and to the citizens of Alamance County uh, to the employees of Alamance County for our benefit of our citizens that's good to hear Do you have a question sir yes yes sir um, I as well want to thank both I mean, you guys have done just such an incredible job uh, from everything that I've seen uh, yeah I've called Bruce and I, he just acts on it right now uh, and Tony exactly the same thing uh, and I truly appreciate it having said that do you have any time frame on the you know my comment to you on Friday was something along the lines of Hey, once we get below the uh, 75, there are going to be more and more people wanting to go online as opposed to um, you know, the call-in. Um, and then I think my next comment was, right or, or otherwise, <laughs> was that once we get you know, considerably below 65, then we'll want to be totally online. Uh, what kind of time frame do you think you're looking at? Well, again... I have another call that we talked. I talked last week to Guilford County. Uh, Tony's uh, friend in Forsyth, where he came from, uh, I got an appointment with him today. To talked to him, but they're using the same software. The call I had with the IT folks uh, on Friday had a couple um, options to look at. Some folks have done well with it. Some have not. They kind of some have offered help on that regard. Uh, again, a small handful. The Forsyth, the Guilfords, with to be honest, a little more money and staff have been a little bit ahead of us. Guilford had the program they had for uh, their um, uh, their uh, uh, animal control center, so they had experience with it. But we're 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 close to. I f I'm feeling pretty good about picking a, a company that we can use, and then once we get it, we have to. Right now, my guys are still fixing the current one internally, and so we have to transition and have time to do that. So I can't give you a time frame. I know the goals are the same. Let's try to get it as the younger folks get on it. I, I think there'll always be a call center and an online option. That seems to be the hybrid program that the state recommends. Mm -hmm. We'll probably continue to do that. But once we get it, I mean, I'll report on you the next time where we are, if that's what you like. Um, but again, I want it to be safe, secure, not confusing, those kinds of things. So I think we're a lot closer, and I'm hoping this week will be closer still. And I appreciate that. All, additionally, for the health department, um, I think he's working on so that they can be able to fill out some of these forms in advance and bring those in printed out or whatever capacity is necessary um, which would hopefully help you guys uh, less hands-on and, and a little more speed so but the speed you've got now is incredible uh, that what you're doing now I am not uh, that was not intended as a uh, slam at all everything you're doing is very very positive and we appreciate it thank you well, we've definitely seen on the news some of the misses you know but most of the folks are doing really well and you know everybody's picked it up it's a it's a challenge of our times it really is so thank you any more questions this is what mr carter said also law enforcement uh is helping tremendously um i just what we were talking about um just like i said the last meeting the whole time one whole section of the health department is at one whole place in town your whole other health department still doing exactly what they have to do yeah. i think hopefully that um none of us have a clue as to what the health department really does except health and it's so much more than that but um at a meeting of the department of social services board this week um i was talking to bruce about what jason colwood told me about 
we don't even have a clue on this either as far as the amount of calls that come in, how that's affecting the crisis line at DSS. Could you elaborate on that as well? So yeah, you know, obviously we had purchased a call system with robust, I mean, for hurricane stuff, haven't had problems, but when you got initially 150,000 people calling at once, I was very, again, it did not crash. A lot of folks crashed. But again, that northern campus, it only has 200 slots, and we, we doubled that um, to get to that. Um, so now we've talked to DSS this week, and we're going to be migrating some of their lines, the, the mission critical lines, over to this side of the building, so it should be okay. We have to wait on AT&T, but uh, it should happen very soon. And again, they're, they're happy with that process. So every day, you know, like you said, there's not just the health things that go mm -hmm. on, there's the courts and everything else that we're trying to deal with and we have some folks down and whatever. So we're, we're all hands on deck and, you know, proud to do it. So. Well, unfortunately, COVID hadn't been a crime deterrent, <laughs> nor, uh, no. nor a child abuse deterrent. No, it has not. If home, anything, it's made it worse. Yeah, and kids at home in a home, just trust me, it's just not good as far as you can think about that. But um, we need to realize, all of us citizens need to realize that you just don't have a crisis like this every month the same day and you're just always planned for it so we really need to um, be supportive and be patient and uh, not be quite so critical when we talk about things like this because we've got a vaccine which is a blessing but we've got people social workers and cps workers have not stayed at home they have been out in the field to make sure that whatever calls they get they're handling them COVID has not scared them away because that's just what they do just like all of our other agencies in this county because you just can't quit because something like that happens and uh, that's one reason we need to support our county workers because um, they keep us going regardless of what comes into this county yes ma'am thank you yeah, thank, thank you, you. Ms. Taggett, I think you're next. I, 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 I have some questions for uh, Director Jim uh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Director, you mentioned that um, the plan is to get 975 doses per week. Um, we've been getting 200 more doses. Are the 975, those are the Pfizer vaccines, is that right? Yes, correct. Those and, are the Pfizer. And the 200, that, is that, that's Moderna, is that's that right? That's Moderna. Um, if you assume those numbers going forward when we open it up to 65 and, and below, do you have a rough sense of, of how long we'll, we'll be in that phase or that second tier? Assuming those numbers, assuming no more J and J, uh, before we get to tier three. Yeah. Um, so just really kind of shooting from the hip. Yeah. Weeks, if not months. When well, as soon as we lower that to 65 and and older, that's another 19,000 of population um, that we have to vaccinate in Alamance County. Okay. So the the J and J would be something that would could potentially be a game changer on that time frame. Uh, we don't know yet, but. If you, if we do get some J, and, if, assuming J and J is approved, assuming we get J and J vaccines, do we have the, the number of providers to to get shots in arms with an, an influx of additional vaccine? So it would depend how much vaccine we're we're sent and how that's divided up um, throughout throughout the state. So. Um, as I mentioned, it, it's encouraging each thir Thursday night when I'm sent how many more providers have come online within Alamance County and even surrounding counties. Um, so that just means when more supply hits the market, there's going to be more folks available to be able to get shots in arms. So I do find that encouraging, but it's really hard to answer to kind of know what that allocation will look like until we get it. And then we'll have to either scale up or scale down according to the... And I would guess all the counties in North Carolina would have the same problem if more vaccine came online are we at least thinking about how we might get more providers in the event we get more vaccine yeah absolutely absolutely and that was part of my call today i mean call to the really the, any providers that are yeah. willing to volunteer or have the ability to sign up please do so register with the state to become a vaccine provider and um, if you can't and you're a licensed or certified provider give us a call we'll put you on the volunteer roll so when it's time to expand um, we will and one thing i forgot to mention we were fortunate we have some national guard folks that were assigned to us um, a little over a week ago so six folks two were vaccinators um, so it's, it's it's nice to have them on site and they are hard workers so we appreciate it thank you you mentioned or it was mentioned in i think it was back in october or november the difficulty that we're having and i presume i haven't heard anything to indicate it's changed that we were really having a hard time trying to hire new nurses to fill the vacancies that we had 
Um, are we still dealing with that issue? And I, I think the number that was used was like $32 an hour that we weren't even getting applicants back then. Are yeah, we still so, running into that problem? In so it, we are. Um, so we still have three contract nurses we're still trying to help uh, hire to help with um, case investigation and, and contact tracing. Um, there's just not a pool of folks waiting around to, to, to come in. And I mean, even when I drive in the along the freeway into work I, I see now hiring nurses we need nurses and so we're not the only ones in that in that boat. right yeah I've had some comments made to me that about uh, recruiting retired nurses maybe have, have we looked into something like that yeah in fact we have um, retired nurses um, volunteering uh, on site um, for the volunteer piece right. and then the actual pay piece for them um, the ones that we have reached out to um, really didn't want to work more than 20 hours per week, which is challenging, um, especially when we need them for more than that. So, right. Yeah. I just have one more simple question. Were you done, Billy? Go ahead. Okay. Um, you were talking about the teachers a while ago. We've watched, um, I just come off the board in November, and, um, and we've watched the, the time get pushed, pushed, pushed. And um, I mean, mental health is the new word. Everybody used, used to be opioids and it was human trafficking. There's always a word, seems like some people want to use, but um, in Clark County Schools District, which is Las Vegas, since March, there have been 18 suicides with kids of school age, the youngest being nine. And I'm no fool. I know that happens everywhere. And, um, and, I, and I'm no fool either to know that it's a teacher's right to decide to get a vaccine. This is not like you're gonna do it. And I know that's kind of like a, a big thing right now to get teachers that are willing to get vaccinated. And I understand that, totally respect that big time to get in that. And um, that's, a, that's a real pressure on vaccine falling out of the sky for us because that's going to be a real pivotal point for this when it comes time to get closer to that. Um, huh. That bothers me. None. Any age, any age. When I look at these death certificates, and there's a lot more I can add to them for our seniors, um, that bothers me. It all bothers me because a life is precious no matter what age it is. And I'm just real concerned about us getting our teachers vaccinated because um, that's going to be the point for the, I feel for the rest of the year with school. And I know parents are breaking, kids are breaking, everybody's breaking. It's that hard because um, this isn't how school's supposed to be. Um, some children do great on a laptop. God bless them. They've got the right kind of support with the family there. Some children don't. They need eight hours a day with ABSS to, to make a life, to be eating two meals a day. It's that important. And um, I just, it's, it's just hard. It's just very difficult. Yeah, Commissioner Thompson, I, I can tell you I have directed one of our nurses and our preparedness coordinator to work with the school system to develop a plan for when it's time to vaccinate teachers that we will have a plan in place that's coordinated to get those teachers vaccinated. And I appreciate that. Well, one of the things we've seen is that I think the Alamance News reported uh, from not last week, I believe, uh, 90 out of 115 districts in North Carolina have in-class instruction now. And uh, then we also looked at the problems with failure rates, either in one class or in, in, in whole grade levels, and an approximating 40%. I mean, that's just totally unacceptable. And uh, I don't know what we need to do with uh, the state, with the part with, uh, with uh, uh, Department of Health and the state to try and get some effort to move those teachers into the critical, uh, what do you call them? Um, uh, critical one of the groups you know what I'm trying to say um, frontline workers or whatever to, so Essential. they can get in, in the vaccine instead of waiting for tier three I mean tier two is already pushing us down another level so uh, I think it's really critical we get these schools open and uh, we're, we're, we're at risk of seeing a lot of kids have a lot of trouble for years into the future as a result of the problems we're having here with not being able to do instruction. I was up in Kentucky this last week my, uh, at my daughter's and uh, saw two county schools up there that are open. Came back through Tennessee, had to stop 
and some uh, going through by some schools on some of the roads and uh, because the schools were open kids were uh, they were the time we were coming through traffic was coming out of the schools, so the schools are open in a lot of places so uh, we, we need to get our teachers in the schools and get our get our schools up running again mr. Lashley one question and I text you over the weekend or emailed you over the weekend and I know some folks are watching today and I just wanted to hear it come out of your mouth uh, when do you expect 65 to 75 74 age group to get started yeah so I think it's reasonable to suggest based on again the, the data points I'm looking either one to three weeks from now um, three weeks. probably you, uh, probably you, even sooner you yeah. will place that information on the website absolutely as okay. soon as soon as that decision is made so what will happen is Thursday night um, when when all that data comes in usually filters in around eight or nine o'clock at night we'll look at it early Friday morning and that'll help inform this so uh, people who are looking would be uh, suggested to check out the website Thursday night into Friday I, I would say check out the website Friday afternoon, Friday into, afternoon. The, into the weekend Excellent. as well as um, we'll, we'll do a media release so it'll um, get released that well and then social media as well thank you very much and I might indicate that um, the health director the uh, county manager and myself are meeting every Friday um, to discuss those issues Excellent. thank you I think it's been a big plus call and talk line because yeah, I've heard a lot of little <clears throat> ladies and little guys saying that they got through and it's uncertainty can kill anything. So I just really appreciate y'all staying and good it communication. Is true. I've had people say I don't have to call you, I just listen to the health department director. Excellent. <laughs> You're becoming our star. <laughs> <laughs> 1 800, call Tony. That's it. <laughs> is there any, anything else, Commissioner? <laughs> Okay, Mr. Haygood. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, you have in your packet a proposed lease for property uh, to be used by the Health Department. Uh, you're all aware that currently the Health Department is doing its first round of vaccinations at SeaTac. Uh, outside, we're using tents and space heaters, porta johns at that location, and the second uh, dose is being given outside also at the Burlington Royal Stadium that has just began last week. So you, uh, we're ready. We're ready to move with health into the next phase of vaccination, which uh, we believe would be best served uh, using indoor space. You have a proposed lease for 25,000 square feet of space located at 2401 Eric Lane, which is uh, over off of Highway 62 Alamance Road. <coughs> Uh, the county would lease the property, but it would be for the health department's vaccination use. Uh, it, we would be planning uh, to work with health to get the property ready for the first vaccination doses, first first round of doses, as of March 1st. That's uh, appropriate too. I believe CTEC uh, is available to us until that time. If the kids do go back to school, we know we'll be looking for another location once they do return. So we would be planning to try to get into the Eric Lane property as of March 1st. We would uh, work with health to, to begin doing second doses at this property when it's appropriate. Health department would uh, work with us and possibly with Cone to figure out when is it pro uh, appropriate to bring the second doses in. But originally it would be for first doses. The lease that you have is a three month lease. Uh, runs from February 1st until uh, the end of April. And it does include an option to renew on a monthly basis after that. Uh, so we felt pretty comfortable with that. We don't know how long we'll need this property. We hope we won't need it long at all. We hope lots of uh, other providers will come online and when vaccine comes down the pipe, it will have lots of ways to get into arms. But uh, felt like a three month lease was probably pretty reasonable. The monthly lease cost uh, is $23,958.33 per month. We would propose taking these uh, lease funds from our Alamance County pandemic budget, which we set up with uh, coronavirus relief funds back last year. We also have a budget amendment in this uh, packet today that we'll be talking about later. Help is receiving about 62,000 new dollars in uh, um, COVID fighting funds that we would put in our pandemic budget that could go toward this lease. And I will tell you, we were alerted end of last week that FEMA has changed its guidelines and we feel pretty confident that these lease costs would also be um, fully reimbursed by FEMA. Uh, they're changing their guidelines to try to help local governments cover these vaccination costs. So what we're reading shows us that this uh, lease could be reimbursed by FEMA too. If we wound up having to use the Eric Lane space, our pandemic budget, we're planning it in most respects out to June 30th. Uh, so for things like court cleaning costs, county uh, building cleaning costs, we don't know if we'll be doing it that long, but that's been our plan. If we were to use the Eric Lane space all the way to June 30th, 
the total lease cost would be $119,791.65. The space at Eric Lane is very large, very, uh, very, very much open space, high ceilings, uh, good for social distancing. Talk with Tony and the health department. Uh, if we do lease this property, health would implement prevention strategies. Uh, these strat uh, to keep prevent the spread of COVID while using an indoor site. These strategies would include uh, pre-entry screening, hand sanitizer, required mask wearing, social distancing. Uh, the facility would be cleaned twice a day and would also um, see frequent cleaning of highly touched surfaces. And in talking with uh, Tony and his staff, we feel like this uh, indoor space at Eric Lane would help reduce some of the safety risks I think the uh, health department staff are seeing at SeaTech. Uh, we believe it'd be a little safer for pedestrians, equipment and vehicles. I know they've had some equipment hit in the parking lots uh, at SeaTech. It'd also be uh, safer for our health department staff and the vaccine itself protecting uh, both from the weather elements. And Tony has also indicated that if folks came to the indoor air plane site and had limited mobility, they would still be able to be served outside in their in their vehicles. But uh, other than that, I'll, I'll try to answer any other questions. We feel like a three month lease is reasonable. It doesn't tie the county to too long of a commitment at this site, but we do have that ability to stay there longer if we need to be uh, with a month to month option. So lease has been reviewed by county attorney, found to be appropriate. So if, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer. Where is Eric Lane? It's over at uh, JR, JR Tobacco. It's, what did uh, it used to be? Show Waccamaw Pottery. Waccamaw yeah. Pottery, yes. Okay. 23 a month? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 23000 Yep. 900 and something. That's great. $23,958.33, uh, which comes out to be uh, about $12, $12.5 per square foot, mm -hmm. average On which. basis. Yeah. Yes, uh, and we're seeing retail space in Alamance County averaging between 11 and 14 dollars a square foot. That, that's not every single retail space, but uh, finding retail space that's open with that much square footage that could accommodate health department and possibly cone, because uh, they've indicated they may be interested in moving into the space too, to maybe get first and second doses in there, and adequate parking. It's been difficult to find. Uh, especially with a three-month lease and the ability to do it uh, renew once a month, that's that's pretty pretty difficult to find. So, is it empty, or yes. do we have to do everything? Okay, it's empty, and I think um, Tony's group, IT folks from Cone, um, uh, Bruce and Sherry have been out there regularly. I think they're going back again today to meet with Cone to dial in. Uh, how would you do? internet access, how would you set up the interior of the building to keep everybody safe while the vaccines are being administered, but still uh, uh, accommodate the number of people that we would need to. So. Does this include all the utilities and those would be separate as my understanding. Everything is included in the lease rate? Uh, I don't believe so. I believe we'll, we'll pay the uh, utilities separately. Oh, really? I believe so. There's a schedule in the, in the agenda that you've got mm -hmm. that yeah. spells out who pays. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are segments. I, would. I do have a few questions, given the opportunity. Okay, hang on just um, one second. Yes, sir. If you look at page, um, it's like 7.4B, I think that's page uh, 50, uh, excuse me, class is 66. That gives you a breakout of what the landlord pays and what the tenant is proposed to pay. That's correct. I think I saw the landlords responsible for mostly of repairs, HVAC, uh, plumbing, and we're responsible for um, utilities. And while Mr. Carter's looking at that, Mr. Lashley, um, I just have a few questions. Why? I think you answered it. You you want a twenty-five thousand square foot space. You're planning on maybe partnering with Cone or some other folks. Thank you. Because 25,000 square foot of space is a boatload of space. Certainly. Um, with, may have to get Tony to, uh, he mentioned something previous in his statement about the new providers coming on. Though these new providers are in their own spots, right? They're on their yes. own. Okay. So that would help alleviate a little bit. Okay. Um, what if, or has it been thought about to maybe have 
instead of one 25,000 square foot space, I have, I'm assuming it's one spot, so staff, it's easier to staff. If you had two spots, it would be probably more difficult. I'm, I'm, I'm making that assumption. I, th I, I believe you are correct. I think I'd have to rely on Tony to, to ensure that I'm understanding it that way too, but I, that, that sounds reasonable okay. to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I did, a little, I did a little homework on my own. And I reached out to retail space. And I found some retail space that I believe that will work for this particular operation. And it'll be a whole, whole lot less expensive. As a matter of fact, I'm firm to close on a 5,000 square foot place for a month for $5,000. Firm to close right now, month to month, use it as long as you want. And how many square feet? 5,000 square foot for 5,000 a month, firm to close, and we can rent as long as we want. Uh, 5,000 square foot space, to me, is a lot of space. And I believe that, to go back to some of the things that you were just talking about, Tony were talking about, this particular location that I'm speaking of uh, will provide everything that you just said. They will provide heat, hot water, bathrooms, security, safety, um, and they will also will allow you, they have a system already set up for internet, so if you wanted to, uh, let's say you come to this location and you uh, had a, um, you're 15 minutes early or the, 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 they were running late, they could set it up just like a restaurant. They could text you, they could give you a little thing to hold on to. And uh, the, the, the place that this uh, location is located is at the Holly Hill Mall. Uh, I've spoke to the owners and they are willing to allow you to have this space. Didn't really discuss with them any larger space because to be honest with you I didn't think um, and I thought 5,000 square foot is quite a large space and with the appointments coming in and the way that these things can be done at Holly Hill Mall uh, you could come to the appointment if you were uh, late or if you were early you could check in you could your people who may bring you could go do some shopping or it, it just seems to be a bit more and do it seven days a week sure the $25,000 number, I was asking Tony, maybe Tony could assist a quick, you don't give vaccinations on Saturday and Sunday, do you? So not, not right now. But you and could. I take, I take that back. We, we do have them uh, second doses, and we, we've built it in as a buffer Saturday and Sunday for weather delays because of the current situation. Mm -hmm. To answer your question, yes, we could, and that's also you know in the plans. If we need to expand and ramp up and we need to utilize those days to get more shots in arms, mm -hmm. we'll take it down as well. Well, you know, I'm just thinking, um, I'm just I'm thinking like this, Tony. If you have these providers coming on, so there's different places and avenues for people to go. Like uh, I go to my doctor's office, just for lack of a better. I can go there. A uh, person can come to your system over there. It's outside. Uh, this would just be another avenue, and it would be an avenue that I believe that we could use. That's extremely affordable. Uh, and if you had to get vaccination seven days a week these folks at the mall are more than willing to take care of that. The only stipulation they have is no COVID testing. Now we can do the vaccinations all day, every day, but no COVID testing. I just feel like you know, the, the risk is just way too high. So I would suggest to uh, maybe consider this piece of property because it's just, uh, it's just my first tier. Uh, I haven't even got to the second tier yet of maybe going to reach out to um, for example, the Graham Recreation Department, the Mevin Recreation Department, there's a lot of rec departments and a lot of gymnasiums that aren't being used. And I was just focusing on the places that currently do uh, blood drives, uh, you know, like churches, fellowship hall, stuff like that. Uh, but I know that the people at the mall told me they can have you up in seven days, ready to go. Uh, and I believe it would be maybe something to take a look at or at least reach out and talk to them um, because Five thousand dollars a month. We're basically paying the same per per foot, but we're doing it on a smaller scale. I mean, five thousand versus twenty-five, and plus we could rent that that five thousand square foot space for two years for one hundred twenty thousand dollars. So it's just my idea, just something to think about. Um, I wanted the other county commissioners to uh, to hear what I'd found uh, through some public retail space, and spoke to the owners and got a firm commitment. Um, so just like for y'all just to think about it. Well, I could say too from experience at the mall, 
I've been working on some things with AC with uh, Algae Gatewood over at ACC on a western local site, Western Alamance County site, and there are a couple of, in addition to 5,000, I think there's around 13,000 total in one one there segment could be other of the mall that's there. open. I just didn't so. go into those options um, because, well, <laughs> personally speaking, gentlemen, I thought 25,000 square feet is overkill. You ever seen what 25,000 square foot space looks like? Oh yes, very large. Monsters. I well, like I to live in one. You have a basketball court in there. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. I appreciate it. Guess question one is, do we need, really need 25,000 or is 5,000, for example, efficient? Would that work? Yeah, so I can say, I, I know working with Cone, they abandoned their, they had something around 8,000 square foot and abandoned those plans. Beg your pardon? Working with Cone um, and, and they, they abandoned part of their plan for an 8,000 square foot facility. They felt it just wasn't big enough um, in conversations with them. The smallest that we looked at um, thus far has been 15,000 square foot, and that, I believe it's 15, right over at uh, Fairchild Park, Park mm -hmm. there, and that facility, and that was just adequate enough when we kind of looked at 15,000 square foot. My current my concern is our goal is um, uh, 500 folks per day, and so, or more, um, but right now it's fine when we have this supply to get 500 folks per day and so that equates to about 60 or more an hour that are that are coming through um, so keeping those folks really distanced and mass is our is our, is our primary um, concern with, with safety and making sure we don't have any spread in these facilities so I mean it does take a fit, big facility a lot of the bottleneck is going to be in the observation area because there you have to wait for 15 or 30 minutes, and that's putting folks in a big room, sitting in chairs that are spaced out. Um, doing you really have four stations, right? You have a, a from, from recollection over at the facility on at SeaTac, you got a, like a check-in, then a processing, then a or, or gathering information, then a then a, administering the vaccine, and then the um, the uh, observation site. So. You've got to have four different stations in the location, and you've got 60 people an hour in that last location. I think they're sitting there for 15 minutes. Is that correct? Anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. 15 to 30 minutes. I have a question. Uh, you use the number 60 an hour. Where's that come from? Is that how many people you can see in an hour? How many vaccinations you can give in an yeah, hour? That's, a, that's actually our, our throughput that we've noticed that's very comfortable throughput. We can increase that. Mm -hmm. and you know, put it with, I forget the saying, but we can increase that capacity, so we have the ability to do so. But 60 an hour, we calculate just in our days that work now from, from seven to, to four, and give us that 500 number. So you're, I'm just a bit confused on the numbers. Sure. I just saw 975 plus 200, it's 1175. Divided by five, gives you about what? Yeah, so we, so those, the, those back, so we do, so case in point, uh, 975, so this week we'll schedule uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, 325 doses um, each day. So that gives us 975. We'll end up wrapping up around um, just afternoon, okay. like around 150. So you're normally given 300 plus a day on the days that you're given. Yeah, we have capacity to do it. And that's it. Like Mr. Carter was saying, it's four places that you're doing this? Mm -hmm. four, it's, four, it's stations, four. check in, and it's like you're going through stations at each point. And then, so you're having to social distance at each location. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking that. Uh, Okay, I'm, I'm just seeing what you're saying. You're, you're, you need more space just to just to have it, um, in the sense of keeping people separate. Like, but the folks that are showing up, are you testing them for COVID? No, testing you're does just, not occur at the vaccine sites. You maybe te uh, giving them a temperature check. Not, uh, not, not, not in their vehicles. Not even we'll, that. I, I take that back. We'll screen them and ask them, "Do you have symptoms today?" Because you cannot get the vaccine if you have symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll get that in the meeting medical screen. They're, they're not taking their temperature, but they're asking how they feel today. Okay. If you move to inside, will you be taking temperatures and doing? Absolutely, you won't be able to come inside until you've been screened with questions and have your temperature. That actually adds a whole other level, then, doesn't it? A whole other station. It does yes. another another volunteer, but I think we can be again with the partnership with Cone, sharing staff. We can be a lot more efficient the way we do. It. Another piece that I haven't mentioned yet. As it takes just for set up on the outdoor space it takes a little over an hour to get all the generators up and running and heaters up and going and, and folks to set up um, in an indoor facility that's that's um we, we won't have to do all that setup that's two more hours we can be giving vaccine 
Um, so that's another 120 more shots, if you will, um, that we can do if we have the supply. So I think the indoor space also would here. allow you to reallocate the um, cost of the tent rental and porta johns and space heaters, and we're renting a great deal of that stuff now to keep the um, outdoor spaces going. So, do you have a number on that? We do. Um, I don't have a handy. Twenty-four thousand. Yeah, it's. Um, I actually have it right a in front of me. Um, so for the, it's, it's right around 20, 27 if you take into account SeaTac, Royals, propane each month, gas for the generators, um, porta potties. Um, so all those costing at about twenty seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars. You're renting SeaTac. No, the no. the tents, the tents and okay. the space heaters and equipment, <laughs> okay. all the all the outdoor setup equipment's right, been ready. Thank you. The one question we haven't asked: This is a February one contract. Uh, how urgent do we have time to start looking around for other locations? Well, I think I know Tony had, and his crew have been to several places and looked, and I think uh, this was the spot that seemed to, at this point, from Health's perspective and from Cone's perspective, work well. Uh, at least in February 1st allows us to get in and start doing some things inside the building with the goal being a March 1st opening. And you I think Mr. Lashley and I and all of us agree we, we, we're trying to be as efficient and uh, um, I think the yeah, discussion just, we've had is to try to make sure we're spending the county's money even though course. this is federal money coming in they took it out of our pockets and yep. sent it up there before we sent it back down here. So Certainly. we're just trying to make sure we're being as efficient as possible. Amen. And yeah. that's an that's an awful lot of money. Yeah. Um, if we can for, get uh, rent, if we can get that partnership with Cone, does that increase the number of vaccines we can administer per hour, or is that keep it at about sixty? So that is my expectation of the partnership. We have to be able. If we're going to partner with Cone. We have to be able to get more shots shots on. That's the whole reason for the okay. Partnership. Is Cone a partner in the twenty-three thousand? I'm sorry. Andy. Does Cone pay any of the twenty-three thousand, or is that just on us? I think those discussions are happening now. So we 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 would guarantee the front of the lease payment for at least three months with this document. And if Cone is able to chip in, that's wonderful. If Cone's able to, I think they have mentioned chipping in to doing some work inside the building to help make it be um, appropriately set up for uh, the clinic itself. So. Mr. Albright, there is an indemnity clause in, in this contract. Is that of any concern to you? We can use the same addendum for any lease. I just put my standard addendum language in there. <laughs> I didn't see any concern on my part either. Thank you. The mile's a great place to vote, but this isn't voting. <laughs> Well, it's just vaccinations. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not. I, I know they did not want COVID testing there. Yeah. I can understand that, but um, I think we do have to take a vote on the uh, approving the lease. Is that correct? I am waiting on a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. Any further discussion? To get this for twenty-three thousand. Actually, it's more than that. Uh, I didn't want to say oh, it. Oh, I just got my last question. It's right at 24. When, when did you mm -hmm. begin this search for this building? Bill. So we probably started early January because we knew we were going to have to. So about three, four we, originally, we were expecting to move out of SeaTac in February, but we were, um, as, as they delayed the opening, that gave us the ability in February and kind of give us more, more, more time to look. Um, I will say the other considerations that we took into place is number one, um, not only the size, but the location. We wanted to make sure that we had good access to freeways and main thoroughfares, good access to public transit, um, and, and try to be as, for now, as centered in the county as possible. So um, that way we're not all the way out on one side and folks from the east have to come to the west or vice versa. Mr. Chairman, I have one question. Yes, sir. Uh, is it possible to lease a portion of this facility so that you can is it collapsible you know is it partitionable i guess is a better word so that you can rent more of it as perhaps a partnership with cone comes online or we get more vaccine uh, i think this is multiple suites so i think that's a possibility i uh I, again i'd have to i know the space planning is going on now so tony i don't know you i'm putting you on the spot but you'd have to speak to the the how the space is being looked at now. Yeah, so they're designing the flow path right now. And so some of that flow path also has to do with 
how the fire marshal will decide on how many folks can be inside that location at one time. So that's another consideration. Again, big, bigger facility, theoretically we can hold more people in there. Um, the other piece is um, that gives us the opportunity to look at doing second doses there as well. So that would be take our outside operations second doses and be able to bring people in that facility as well. So it'll be one central hub. Um, but as with every all of this, you know, we will continue to evaluate weekly on looking at do we need to expand, do we need to contract. Um, when it gets to a point that there's so many providers out there on a month-to-month -month basis, then it's reasonable to suggest it's time to contract and look for something small and come up with an alternative plan. Uh, if what's your estimation? I mean, I don't. I'm not holding you a firm number. How long do you think it's going to take to get Alamance County citizens vaccinated? So, if I can, I remember how I did the calculation, but. Uh, it was something, all, all things being equal, and the amount of doses, like 975 doses we're getting, um, I think I calculated over a year's worth of, of, of time to be able to do that. The so reason I, I asked that question is what's the possibility of having this thing for a whole entire year, paying 23 grand a month? So, um, it, it is possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is possible. So what happens if uh, after four months we say we, we don't have the money, or the money doesn't come in? We're going to shut down this operation, and you're going to have to go back to your what how you initially started I, I would tell I, the commissioner I'm asking uh, I would tell the commissioners that the way from county managers perspective we've looked at this is there's nothing more important going on right now than vaccinating citizens sure. so if we got to the point where we exhausted all of our uh, pandemic budget which we had about 2.7 million dollars in it which we've allocated all over the place because we're cleaning courts we're cleaning buildings we're screening folks uh, FEMA we believe is going to reimburse us but if all that fell through I'd be coming before you saying we're either going to have to dip into our fund balance or find money elsewhere in the county's budget because I, as long as Tony's getting the vaccine, I don't think there's anything else we can do from our perspective but make sure he's got the resources he needs to do it. So if we wound up using this space and it went longer than we have funding for, we, we'd have to find the money uh, without doubt. I mean, I, that would be my suggestion to the commissioners uh, if we, we'd find it. Let me make sure I understand the numbers. All right, we're spending currently approximately $24,000 on generators, on tents, on everything else per month. And that's on two locations, is that correct? That's yes, correct. about 20 And so we're talking about uh, roughly $24,000, i am rounding up and set it down, uh, on this location. So it's almost a swap out, is that correct? I think if you, if you eventually move both uh, the first and second dose site into this, it, it would be yes, it would be very close. What's your plan on keeping SeaTech along with the new facility? The, stadium, the Burlington Stadium site for now for okay. second doses. Thank you. Um, and this will give us some time to work out all the logistics in sure. a new facility and work out all the bugs before we consider moving that. Next. But once you did that, then it would almost be an equal expenditure. You wouldn't. You would no longer be renting the tents and the space heaters, porta johns, tables, chairs, all those Generators. kind of things. Which will, as soon as Tony moves the uh, first dose operation into. The, a new indoor site will stop at SeaTac, um, and then you know again. Hopefully, it'll it'll be appropriate to move the second dose in too, and we stop that stop all those uh, rentals as well. So, so the rental on SeaTac is they're just for the tents and heaters thirteen thousand nine seventy. And the Royal Stadium. When do you anticipate leaving it and going to this site? I would say at least a month or two. Again, that'll. Give us time to move in, work out the operations, develop that partnership with Co, and then we can evaluate the next step. Um, so within a couple of months, we'd be spending the same dollars at a new location. Correct. Well, actually, less. A little bit yeah. less. Yeah. And the hope will be that enough uh, private providers will come on board that this that it'll be lots of points of entry for this, and we don't need any space for county government. That would be the best place to be. Sure. Folks are going hospital, their doctor. Uh, pharmacies everywhere else health department too of course but they've got so many other options we don't need to we don't need to do this any other discussion we have a motion and a second there's no other discussion I'd call a vote all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. all opposed carries unanimously thank you gentlemen Okay, at this point, uh, I believe we go into executive, or excuse me, into closed session um, with Mr. Albright.
So we'll take a recess at this point while we go into, um, or actually we don't take a recess, do we? No. You can take a recess and then go into closed session. I, okay. I need a recess. <laughs> take a recess okay. and then go into closed session. We're going to take a 10 minute recess for all those that we'd like and then uh, we'll go into closed session. Thank you. I'm going to call us back into session. Okay, I think we have the planning director here. It's good to see you again. Yeah, too. I would say good morning. We're getting close to the end of that, so we'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> got a lot of information this morning. I sure did. I think you looked at the car. You can hang on just for one second. Sure. Okay. Um, so Thank you. All right, y'all ready to go? Ready to roll. So today is just an informational session that I brought before you all. Steve being the only member um, of commissioners that went through our land development plan process. So I wanted to kind of throw the highlights. This is going to be a lot of information in a short window. So stop me, talk to me, ask questions. And we'll move forward and see what we can figure out. So that's what the new land development plan cover looks like, the final approved version. There we go. Oh, good. So it's okay. Okay, so here is the map that came out of the land development plan. The map for the land development plan is giving you what, in the future idea, what growth would look like and where we would concentrate growth in Alamance County. You can see the orange areas, those are municipal limits. Those are things that we can't plan for, only the municipalities can plan for those areas. You have ETJs, they're extraterritorial jurisdiction. They also plan for those. The county only does nuisance in the ETJs and that's according to state law allows for those kind of differences. And you'll see where we've made recommendations. Um, you can see kind of general gist of the county is the light and dark green to more agricultural areas and then as you move into what would be the pink and dark pink circular areas or more of the commercial uh, rural commercial and employment center areas most of which are shown here because they're existing the rural center areas which you'll see on the north side and the south side have the dark dashed lines around them those are areas that we've already seen some level of commercial development in we wouldn't want to ignore that when we're doing our future planning. We'd want to include those uh, as areas that would continue to see a level of some small commercial development in those specific spaces. And then you've got the light green, which we call rural residential. That is a little bit different than what the agricultural area, the darker green, looks like. And then the dark, dark green are open space and parks. And those are things that we've already established. We're just going off data that we already had. This map is developed through the tax data. Since we don't have zoning in Alamance County, this is pretty much done according to what we're already coding in tax. And that's the data that we can use to start pulling things and information together. Uh, just a few highlights from the land development plan. As the public events went, we had six steering committee meetings. The steering committee was about a dozen people. A few members appointed through commissioners some from our planning board, our historic properties board, and then just prominent people in the community being developers, um, real estate agents, just an engineers thing, people that would know something about what land planning is to make sure we got it right. And they were the guiding factor of how we moved through the land development plan. We had stakeholder groups, and those were groups that were specifically picked out for church and religion. Uh, local municipal leaders and you had like downtown development leaders and we had one-on-one -on -one meetings with those groups to see where their future development was specifically with the municipalities any expansions they were expecting because we wouldn't want to plan for that they would plan for that and we will make sure that we don't spend too much time on something that wouldn't be ours to do uh, we had a county summit that was like a month before COVID hit us in March mm -hmm. so that was a wonderful <laughs> summit we had lots of uh, input we had all the local jurisdictions there. We there even had state representative, our uh, county representatives, a couple community representatives, heavily economic development. 
because there is a strong economic development piece to land planning and in the land development plan as well. Uh, it's a great summit. Uh, got a lot of people involved that maybe wouldn't have been involved otherwise. Um, as that finished, that began our public outreach effort in which the entire country shut down. So at that point, we had to go virtual really fast. We did two virtual workshops and then we did uh, public open houses. We did virtual information sessions as well. We did it live through Facebook. We went on YouTube. We have a web, the website is still up too. The website provides all the information along the way of what we did. If anybody wanted references to that or missed something, it's all on that website as well. So we went very virtual very quickly um, and something that we have never traditionally done in these planned developments. Uh, so we began our process in early 2019, and that was discussions with commissioners beginning to hire on our consultant, putting that RFP out, and really getting going. And then we had the final version of the plan in November 2020. This plan is about a 10-year plan. It projects what we see as uh, where our growth is going to be after speaking to stakeholders and doing the community summit, looking at tax data, all of these things. And so you're good for about 10 years on these types of plans. If you have explosive growth, of course, you need to revisit before then. The last time this plan was done was in 2007. Uh, data from that plan was really from 2005 because that's when they started the plan. So the data and what was written was a bit older than 10 years when we got started. So this is called an update. It was more or less a rewrite because what we kept a few of the initiatives from the 2007 plan but most had either taken care of themselves or weren't valid anymore so we moved through that process um, the plan update included looking at the future for the whole county you see that county map um, that we were at a minute ago so that shows the whole county map and then on the tail end of it i think about page 50 or 55 you've got the snow camp area small area plan so that commissioners, when they voted to do this, wanted to include that because of the beginnings of what was the rock quarry concerns. That started in 2017, so that predates me. But when this discussion was going on, that was still being discussed. So it was important to commissioners to go ahead and include something very specific for that area. So at the end of this plan, there is a small area plan just for snow camp. All of that was approved in one vote all at one time in the November 2020 meeting. So what we get you back to where I'm at. Um, what we looked at and found out during our development, the county area total is 434 square miles. Uh, but the county actually covers about 76% of the land in the county is county jurisdiction. It's not even municipal jurisdiction. Even our municipal friends were a little surprised that we had that much land that we need to plan for around them. Uh, population wise, of course, we don't hold as much as the rest of the county, but potentially, depending on our how our development goes, that could change dramatically. I know that someone's projection put the county wide at 200,000 people in the next five years. That's a lot of people to plan for to come in, and our municipal limits are very full right now. They, of course, can expand their limits, but it would lead you to believe that these people are coming into the county. And as we went through, uh, we did an online survey trying to get people involved and people were scared, of course, to come out due to COVID. So we did a lot of input online. We actually had almost 1800 surveys returned to us. And in just the background information, the last time we did an update, we had 60. So by going virtual, we got a lot more involvement than we ever thought we would or that we have in the past. Um, so after getting all the input and doing all the um, stakeholder meetings and things, we got what is a land development plan recommendations so a land development plan is not an ordinance that tells you you have to have you know 30,000 square foot lot and you have to have setbacks of 50 foot this is a land planning tool that gives you recommendations on what things could occur and how to address those to make it better in Alamance County and you address these through ordinances that do speak to those types of things of you know what types of roads you're going to have and then what kind of setbacks or lot widths or lot sizes so you can see we different recommendations from different areas. We had economic development, transportation, industrial development, commercial, residential, agricultural, historical, community appearance, and environmental quality. So we tried to hit all the things that would be a part of development in the county for the future. And you know you can see we talked about just landscaping, revitalization. Um, right now we don't have any parking requirements in the county so those are things that we probably need to put some information in but in the next 10 years where this plan comes to play 
the part that we were talking seriously about today is more the snow camp small area plan this is a map giving you the physical boundaries of what that plan included so um, in the land development plan you'll see there's a map that shows small area plans that cover the entire county the idea being part of the consultants job was to help us figure out where would we break these small area plans up and how they would look if we decided to move forward with covering the whole county in small area plans and doing them every few years then where will we draw those lines so there is a map in the land development plan that covers that as well and those are things that we can move forward with in the future we have a great template now for a small area plan you wouldn't want to do um, the level of a small area plan as a complete project across the county because each area of the county is so different they need very specific guidelines and specific needs uh, like you all know the northern part of our county is growing slower than the southern part so we have to pay a little more attention to that is that the map on page 67 of this i think so that sounds right because you've got several of the uh, small area maps and they're showing you know agriculture and different things that is well we've touched up the map just a little bit just throwing some roads on there and some more information so you won't find that exact map in the plan but it starts with that base map that you're All looking right. at Thank you. and y'all have that digitally attached to your um, item today it's a big document but it says a whole lot but that is the geographic area we're talking about yes the geographic area doesn't change on all those maps so you're looking at the same thing on all those thank you but just to give reference we luckily our GS department had time to help us out with all this but we threw some street names and things on here to give y'all a reference point of uh, where that kind of starts and stops and when we originally started drawing this map snow camp became this <coughs> small place and then we're like well we need to include this well we need to include that well we don't want to leave these people out and then if we leave too much of a sliver on the west side what do you call that so when everybody putting their two cents in from our committee it became much bigger and it went all the way west and south because those areas actually do impact snow camp and what comes out of them so we wanted to include them in the small area plan so in the small area plan plan there are recommendations for possible zoning options and in the zoning recommendations there are choice a b and c these have been talked about extensively with commissioners with planning board and with the um, committee that did all this so option a is to designate four zoning districts based on use and character which are given brief uh, information in the land development plan that will co correspond to our future land use map um, and a fourth district possibly for industrial and that would be just in with snow camp option b is implement countywide zoning we're recommending six to seven zoning districts to cover other needs that are currently already existing in the county we wouldn't want to zone and then have non-conforming uses right off the bat that allows a different set of rules and other issues to come up so six to seven options of zoning if we were to look at the entire county and this would be a larger effort than implementing of course just the southwest area of the snow camp air small area plan Option C is establish overlay district of agricultural areas in snow camp or countywide and discourage high density residential growth and heavy industrial use in these areas through dimensional standards or special use permit. So when you see overlay district, that's probably not something you all have any familiarity with, but your option is to take what we see as the higher availability and more likelihood of development areas and lay over a buffer like if you wanted to go down 54 and throw a two mile buffer on each side and you want to plan for that area so you would call that an overlay district and write something out specific for that overlay if you feel like you needed to do 49 or 62 or any of those most of the time they are around some large transportation piece or some specific place you don't just randomly throw them in the middle of the county to say now i need an overlay here so that's an option as well so between the three options you have an overlay option you've got your snow camp area plan option and then you've got countywide zoning it doesn't mean you have to pick one well if you pick countywide zoning you've done it all but you can mix and match you could do specific overlay areas that you all are concerned with and stick with the um, southwest in the snow camp area plan too the snow camp area plan has all of their possible zoning districts pretty much written out already and i know that's a little bit small but you all um, can get a copy of the powerpoint too and it's in the ordinance it's, it's in the land development plan itself 
So the consultants uh, went ahead and laid out what we would define as zoning districts specific to Snow Camp. And we're covering really just to keep the culture and quality of Snow Camp was the goal of these zoning districts but to also include what we already know is going on there. We've got a little bit of commercial, small stores and things. We've got a little bit of industrial, but we have a lot of residential and we have a lot of agriculture. So just for your information, for state law, if someone's a bona fide farm use, they're allowed to do their bona fide farm use in whatever district they need to. That's just something that is allowed in the counties and that's state law kind of guidance. To get bona fide, there's a process in that, but that doesn't does not include us that also includes tax department and the state but agricultural use i know there's a lot of fear that that would go away that's kind of a privilege to have when you get the bona fide farm you're allowed to do that the farmers that are existing of course will continue to be allowed to do that until they decide to change um, i've said a lot and it goes in even those simple little zoning districts go into lot sizes and they go into what we call cluster development. Cluster development very basically goes into if you hit 20 acres, you get an acre, one acre lot, take away 10% or whatever for infrastructure, you put 19 lots on the property, right? So if you wanted to cluster that development, then you would take, you could only do 19 lots no matter what. You would take your 19 lots, put them where you would like on your property and your lot size is not the driver. The total amount of lots is a driver what's left over on your 20 acres has to be forever and conserved and not be built on. So that's part of what you write up during the subdivision process. That land will always be conserved and nobody can develop it. It's a little less cost for the developers because there's less infrastructure to have to go in and it conserves some green space for the county. So it can work out and it's one of the recommended things to change for the county. We allow cluster development right now, but it's only in certain watershed districts that you can do that. So it's very limited on anybody that could do it. It's only a small percentage of the county's land. Now I also know that you all are looking at what if we did a moratorium? So moratoriums are very, very legalized, which is why legal has sent y'all some information, I think over the last few months on that. Um, moratoriums, you need to be very specific on what you want the moratorium on where you want the moratorium, how long you want the moratorium. Anything goes over 60 days of moratorium, there's a different advertisement requirement for the public here. Uh, the board in making the decision, part of the decision for the moratorium is giving clear statements on what you're doing, why you're doing, and for how long you're doing. And then if the board wishes to adopt a development moratorium, the board will need to determine the rationale for the moratorium and schedule for what actions need to be taken during the moratorium. If the board believes that the creation of a small area plan justifies a moratorium, then the board will need to establish a schedule for imposing one of the following zoning options in the moratorium. So, should y'all decide to move forward with the moratorium, at that same time that you're making that decision, you're also making the decision that yes, in some way, shape, or form, the county is moving forward with zoning. If you decide to move forward with zoning, then we have the complex situation of how do we do that? At a staff level, if we only did the snow camp area plan at a staff level i have very little capacity right now to do that we would definitely lean on our consultants that did this project would be a great example to help us with that project and it'd be about a six month process so anything more than that we start adding time if we're going to do overlays if we're going to do a complete county zoning is a two-year process and that's um pretty involved is windshield survey going piece by piece we want to make sure we get it right we don't go just by maps we don't go to by tax data we actually visit and go down the road and mark each piece of property to make sure that the zoning is appropriate for what is existing once you do that then you've got to go through the process of notifying property owners of what their proposed zoning is once you've written all the information of lot sizes and who's got what and what districts are allowed if we stick to six to seven districts for the whole county once those property owners are notified of what we're proposing, they get to come before you all. If they decide that they don't really care for that and they'd like something else, they get that right as well. So each parcel in the county, and we're talking about about 90,000 parcels, would have to be notified. Um, some, of course, would have the same property ownership, but we would have to notify each one, usually by like a postcard type thing. So there is a little bit of expense involved in that between the printing and the mailing. And then, of course, you have to have your hearings and things. So it's not a it's a step-by-step -step process it's not something that you pull the trigger on really quickly and it's not something you take 
hastily and decide to do. That's a very important process and it's something, as you all know, Alamance County has never done. So it puts it on your shoulders to say, now is the time to do something, but what is that? Question. If we, we can do a small, we can limit a moratorium for the, for the purpose of zoning a small area without doing the, the whole county. And you're saying that, I think you just said that doing option A for the snow camp area would take about six months with the utilization of a um, consultant. Mm -hmm. So the earliest we could hold a hearing on that, as I understand from the new law, would be March the 1st. Does that sound right to you? Well, it depends on how long you want that moratorium. That well, depends on how many times you have to... If we were going to take six months to do it, would we not need a six-month moratorium? That totally is up to you all, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. What does that mean? That's totally up to us as far as what he's asking as far as the time. Well, the time is something you all said. There's no law to guide you on that or whatever. The law guides you on what requirements you have. If you go past 60 days of a moratorium, you have different guidelines right. you have to follow. The difference in... A month or about a month of the public it's hearing two to advertisements to get past right. 60 days it's a one advertisement just to do 60 days which means to in order to advertising for the public hearing is what he's talking about in order to do the public hearing we have to have time with the newspaper to get it printed. Gotcha. but that would a 60-day moratorium would not get us through the planning process no it would not that wouldn't hardly get us started so it, it seems logical to me it, it just and please i'm adding, asking for your guidance to make sure that I'm right, but it seems logical to me that if we're going to do a moratorium for a small area plan and it's going to take six months, the logical moratorium period would be a six month period. Well, six months to write it. And that's once we get our consultants on board and everything. So there's a administrative time there to get that piece straightened out and then bring them in. So we could so. do another moratorium at the end of the six months if we hadn't that's finished a legal the implementation? Question. You got to have a good reason to. You can extend it, but you must have a very good reason to extend Would it. the fact that we were not done at that point in time not be a good reason? Be up to the board okay. to decide if that was adequate. Okay. If you did the six months, that would require what? Two hearings? It would no, require two. No, it would require one, one hearing, two hearing, advertisements. One hearing, two two advertisements. Two, two notices. Advertisements. Thank you. Two notices, ten days apart for one hearing. Which would make us just miss y'all's next hearing meeting it will set us for for that March first, first meeting. meeting you couldn't have a special call meeting in between before that March meeting mm -mm. okay you okay yeah, you can't shorten the 20 days okay I have to have that 20 days yes. gotcha. plus a couple mm. days to get it to gotcha. that's a couple <laughs> days out from the time I I'll can get you some it. stamps <laughs> <laughs> and so those are bars consideration Okay. The board has to kind of figure out what they want to do in these processes just to let you know once something is written uh, Then it has to go to our planning board. They review and recommend to you all uh, before it actually comes to you all for a final decision Awesome. Okay, still. When is the next planning board meeting? Mm, should be next Thursday. They meet the second yeah, Thursday right. every month yeah. I'd like to make a motion. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Prior to that discussion. If the board were to adopt a small area plan, zoning for a small area plan, um, did I read the materials correctly that the, the planning board's recommendation is that we proceed with a combination of option A and C? Yes, they were looking at the overlay and the small area plan together was their recommendation. Can you tell me why a combination of A and C as opposed to just A or C? So everybody's in support of A. The reason we wrote the small area plan is so that we can follow up with zoning. I don't think anybody's argued that on any boards or our committee. The other conversations have gone that if we do that and then we put something in in Snow Camp, people don't like that or developers don't like that. They're just going to push to other sections of the county that are more prominent areas for growth as well. So we'll protect the areas that they would think that that would be pushed to. Uh, some probably in the southeast area. So they wanted to do overlays on corridors that we already have strong development and would probably have a lot more strong development if we do some kind of zoning in the southwest area. And that by including option C with option A, you are discouraging the development in other places of the county. 
That's is that what you're saying? At least encouraging some type of controls and some ideas of how that development should go. If we write zoning for the snow camp area and then write plan planning and zoning for those corridors, you're controlling and guiding growth the way the county would like to see it and not just running people different sections that have no controls. Now, option C says snow camp or countywide, right? Yes. Overlay district, yes. Right. Specific to the overlay is what that's being. So okay. it, even if you didn't do the whole southwest um, snow, snow camp area plan, then option C could allow you to put overlays in specific areas there as well and not do the whole area. Because there's, there's a lot of farmland and stuff in that area too. I think the perception was that there are some areas that feel like they're going to get some strong growth and those could be overlays as opposed to doing the whole area. So A, and, A is all of snow count and C is specific to overlays. So why would you do A and C? That sounds like two different options. So C is just overlays in snow camp. A is all of snow camp. Okay. Which we already have the base for that one. Right, right. But That's we've what I paid thought. for already. Okay. Other questions? I'd like to make a motion that we move forward with a small area plan for snow camp, plan A, anticipating that the process will require a six month period and that we implement a moratorium requiring a public health a hearing to be held at the meeting on March the 1st, 2021. I'd like to second that. Question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could, could we, if we proceeded with option A as the motion uh, contemplates, could we, through our planning, decide to add option C just to the small development plan for Snow Camp later? Well, so you wouldn't do it just, Snow Camp's going to be taken care of through option A. Option C would be overlays somewhere else in the county if that became our interest. Why couldn't you do, as I understood the recommendation was, was option A with option C mm -hmm. but, but for the whole county, but could you not? Do you not incorporate option C and option A just for snow camp? Well, so option A is going to cover snow camp no matter what. Option C would have said if you didn't do option A, then we'll just cover the highlights of snow camp. So okay. C is really the reason they chose C is to do overlays in the rest of the county. I understand. Because they I felt understand. like snow camp was already covered in option okay. A. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are there any other questions by any board members? Am I ready for a vote? Sure. Okay, we have a motion. Who did the second? I did. That's right. Sorry. All right. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. <coughs> Okay, um, Mr. Haygood. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, commissioners, you have in your packet a copy of the uh, calendar of events for the budget process for next fiscal year, fiscal year 21-22. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick run through for you. This item doesn't take any action. This is simply for your information to kind of give you an idea of the timeline we're looking at to get the budget ready for next fiscal year. Uh, as, you, as you look over this sheet in your packet, uh, some important dates to note, February 24th, all county department budget requests will be due uh, into the county manager's office in the budget department. Then on uh, March 1st, outside agencies budget requests will be due. This will be uh, many of the nonprofit groups that we fund, as well as the educational uh, groups. Then we uh, plan to present our capital plan to the commissioners on March 15th. That's to give you an idea of what the capital plan is shaping up to look like. Then uh, I've put on the calendar here that the commissioners could pick two consecutive dates in April to receive presentations from all county departments, educational groups, all nonprofits. We've done this in the past. You know, our budget process has gone back and forth in the past. Uh, we've only had a few groups make actual presentations to the commissioners with everybody else available if you had questions. And in the past, we had had everybody had the opportunity to come before the board. So. What I've done is put in the month of April, if the commissioners want to do it that way, you want to hear from all county department heads and the leadership or representatives from all nonprofits as well as the uh, 
leadership from the uh, school system and the community college. We would need to pick a couple of dates in April, preferably back to back, separate from your normal meeting date. So these would be two brand new days. Folks would come in, we'd set up some space, possibly across the street somewhere, where uh, these groups could come in and talk to you and you get a chance to ask questions of every group that comes before you. Um, and we don't have to set these dates today. Uh, in fact, I can send something out to you to start trying to get a poll together of when in April they might be good, is that daytime or evening or whatever. But I wanted to kind of gauge a reaction to, to folks like that idea. Then uh, we're looking at in May, we would be May 3rd, we'd come to the commissioners with a revenue projection information. And then uh, if we hold to this schedule, uh, I believe I could have a recommended budget to the commissioners on May the 17th. That's a regularly scheduled commissioner meeting. And then uh, the commissioners would be able to schedule the public hearing for the budget on June the 7th. That is a daytime meeting, but we have in the past changed those. A lot of times folks want to come to those meetings. So if we needed to change it, we'd have ample time to change it to an evening meeting. After the public hearing, the commissioners can adopt the budget if everyone's happy with it and like it. You can't adopt it on June the 7th. You just have to have the public hearing first. But in the event when you need more time to deliberate it or uh, make changes to it, uh, we're looking at June the 21st as being the last regularly scheduled commissioners meeting date where you could adopt the budget. If we still went beyond June 21st with issues about the budget, we could do a special call meeting. The goal would be uh, to get the budget for next fiscal year adopted before June 30th. So we're we're running it. We've got our brand new budget uh, starting July 1. So um, this is pretty typical of our of our process, with the exception of the April dates. And if that sounds good to the commissioners, I'll start after this meeting. Start sending you some information about what what dates might work. How does how do your calendars look? So let me just say um, for new commissioners, we have to have uh, or required by state law to have a budget in place. On or before June 1, uh, July, July 1, yeah. uh, when we start our new fiscal year. So, uh, I know that. and I've, uh, Steve Carter and I both have probably seen a combination of all kinds of things. Uh, 2014, uh, David I. Smith was chair, and he wanted to have himself and one single other board member. Uh, that didn't work because I was a commissioner and I kind of attended every meeting anyhow because <laughs> uh, I felt like I could not make an informed decision without having attended those. Uh, you know, I think, but last year you guys, I think you heard from everybody. We did. Uh, and I think that's a really, really good process. Uh, whether you've been on the board before or not, You, I don't know how you can really understand the budget needs without having some input from those department heads. And then you also have a number of uh, and I've forgotten how many uh, nonprofits and so forth that we also contribute in our budgets. Um, so I think it's really important that you understand what the needs are, uh, what the numbers are before we pass a budget. Uh, so that April date, uh, to me, becomes really important. And I would encourage us to have all five of us uh, attend those two-day sessions. And it'll take probably two days to do it uh, yes. because if you're going to hear oh, from does, a lot yeah. of different people. Um, a lot of different people. Yeah, but I think it's a, the best. And Steve, would you agree? I agree with that? totally with you on that, Colin. Yeah. Well, there's no action needed, but if I uh, wanted to put this in front of you, we're getting started. Finance and the budget department have already done a lot of work behind the scenes. They're getting the new packets out. They're starting to work with department heads. So uh, this kind of gives you an idea of some some important dates. And it sounds like the commissioners are interested in the two day deal where folks come before you and go over their budgets. Uh, Is that live streamed like this? Uh, we would have the department head or the uh, nonprofit agency leader actually come before you and present physically, Good. but we would make it all live stream. It would be available to the public to see, and most likely that's how we would do it. It depends on the space. We may be able to accommodate some public to come into the space. I'm thinking possibly across the street, maybe in our activity room. We may try it over there. We can get a few folks in there, but we'll we'll live stream it so people can tune in and, and hear what you hear. Yeah, my thought would be we do it here simply because. We have the cameras, we have the screens, we have anything that's needed here. And across the street, we simply don't have that. Right. Uh, and everything should be available by Zoom anyway. 
so the general public would have full access. If, if we if we do it here and do it daytime, it very similar to today. The courts are really using our overflow all the time, so it would probably be just commissioners, staff, and uh, the department heads or leaders coming in, rotating in and out. The board's fine with that. This is a good space. We would make sure that it's uh, again streamed online, so so folks can watch too. I'm good with that, guys. Oh yeah, anytime the county can see all the awesome people that work for them as far as nonprofits and what they really do, it, that's just a bonus. I would request then that you send out some kind of uh, something to all five of us so we can give you some dates and, and whatever, or maybe just suggest a number of dates and see what the availability is. We will, we will do that this um, after the meeting today. Right. It's Thank just you. five of us. There's a whole lot of people, so it'd probably mm -hmm. be around their schedule. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can assure you, I, the folks will <laughs> they'll relish the opportunity. I think to come before you and tell their story and tell about what they do. So, uh, if we can get a date that's good for the commissioners, and you know, we have the you know usually have our very large agencies, uh, the school system, the community college, uh, the sheriff's department, health, DSS. Those are the really large. Uh, that's the majority of our budget frankly so we want to make sure that those folks can work in those two dates too and then we'll get we'll get everybody in and I would suggest we have them back to back if at all possible oh, yes. it keeps it all together and concise and obviously uh, the larger agencies will have more time slots slot availability than the smaller groups yes it'll be a wide gamut you'll hear that some folks will have maybe five minutes of talk it's very small amounts of dollars all the way up to you know ABSS uh, to where 30, you'll hear you hear a lot. Seven minutes. And Pam, you can be you can rest assured they will all want to be here whenever we set up the time. So I'll just get a gong. Oh. Right. <laughs> Terry, Terry, that was a joke. And uh -huh. I don't want to be arrested by <laughs> <laughs> Arrest him, Terry, arrest him. Uh, he needs he needs a he needs a, a, a jailhouse moniker as well. Right? <laughs> Next agenda item. <laughs> uh, continue, please. Sir. So the next item on your agenda, I received a memo from Mr. Jeremy Teeter, finance officer of Alamance Parliament School System. Uh, Mr. Teeter was indicating in, via his memo that the Board of Education is formally requesting that the commissioners consider increasing the monthly stipend of Board of Education members. The current stipend for the Board of Education members is $100 per month, and uh, the board uh, has unanimously consented uh, to go with a $300, um, ask for a $300 increase per month for the board members and make that effective back to July of 2020. And what I've uh, read from the memo from Mr. Teeter indicates that they would be using local funds in their budget this year. They're not asking for additional funds to be given to the school system. But Let me slow you down one minute. I think you said a $300 increase. I think it's 100 to 300 right? That's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Taking uh, The request is to take their stipend from $100 a month to $300 a month. And uh, by statute, the commissioners do have to approve uh, this to be done for the Board of Education members. So. Can I make a comment before we talk about this? I was on the board at the time this happened, and the board itself did not make this motion. The seven of us did not, I mean, a lot of us said no, 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 because, I mean, you really you serve. You don't do it for money. But um, I just wanted to know that was brought before the board for that to happen, because there are a lot of school boards across this county that make a whole lot more than that or a whole lot less, and this has been the same amount since they combined county and city um, schools but um, I need to know if I should even vote because I was on the board from July to November which you're talking about going back on it and that would be looking at about a thousand bucks for me and I I, uh -uh, I don't want to do that myself. Mr. Lashman, you're, you're the one about retroactive. Do you want to speak on that <laughs> issue? I will not be voting on this. I will not ever vote for a retroactive pay raise ever again because the citizens uh, I, I just never, it's never happened to me, and it's just something that happens in government, doesn't happen in the private sector, so I'll be more than happy to, to let them, you know, uh, do these numbers and and take care of it in the budget that's coming up that we will talk to them. They've been more than happy to make that request at that time, be more than happy to consider it, that request at that time, but I will not be voting for this today. And I substantially agree. I think uh, we've got a budget coming up. We'll be discussing it in April with them. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I'm not sure why we should one retroactively do it and two give the increase now. Add a little context to it. I will. I will admit that this was on up for discussion last year. Mm -hmm. um, we we considered it, but because of COVID and because of the impact potential impact on the budget of COVID, we did. It was as a lot of other issues were uh, deferred. This one was deferred. Um, uh, in their defense, I think they probably spend a lot more time. Um, than they get compensated for and a lot of travel time and what they try to do as well. But at the same time, I agree that this probably ought to be brought to us at the uh, time we consider the budget. Very well. And get the schools open. Mm -hmm. I love to pay people that like to work. Amen. I love to pay people that like to work. I'm hearing no motion. I assume we continue on. Okay, um, say good, are you doing the budget amendments? I believe we have Mr. Zipperman from EMS oh, here with us today. Thank you. Good to see you, sir. Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, so really quickly, um, we've got a budget amendment to bring before you uh, for your approval. So EMS was awarded an additional uh, $28,931.96 in federal CARES funding uh, to further support our response to the COVID pandemic. Uh, these funds will be used to cover equipment such as cleaning supplies and personal protective equipment, which we have gone through uh, more in the last year than in my previous 20. Um, this doesn't require any matching funds uh, from the county. It will be treated much <coughs> like the, the previous CARES funding. And uh, so I wanted to see if you all had any questions. I'll uh, just make a motion that we approve it. Second. Any second. other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Unanimous. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Health Director. Please. Now, good afternoon. <laughs> yeah. So, the, the first one, I don't know which one you have in front of you first, but uh, the first one is for a grant from the state from in 62,815. There is no local match to this. It is solely for vaccination effort. Um, as the county man manager um, mentioned earlier, this will is what will be applied for the uh, lease on the, the building. Motion to approve. I'll second. We have motion, second. Any further discussion? Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimous. All right, and the second one again is from the state in the amount of $195,385. There's no local match required. This one in particular is for all things COVID, so equipment, case investigators, testing, to carry out surveillance, communication, so um, supplies, uh, anything we needed for COVID. And where do you get these funds from the state? From the state through our state agreement addendum. Yes. Motion to approve. Second. Any further discussion? Being none. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimous. And I might point out uh, all three of those plus the one that uh, the high sheriff is getting ready to talk about are not coming out of county budget monies. Had you scared there for a minute, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the Alamance County Sheriff's Office is applied through the Governor's Crime Commission for a grant uh, for equipment for our patrol division to deal with civil unrest. As you all know, we have had 40 uh, plus uh, demonstrations here, and we've had to use a lot of our patrol division. They were not properly equipped, and we're asking for uh, twenty-four thousand, excuse me, twenty-four thousand three hundred dollars from the Governor's Crime Commission to buy the equipment for our patrol division, and it requires no match from the County of Alamance. Motion to approve. Second. Um, I I will not need to vote on this because I serve on the she Governor's Crime on. Commission scoring the grants, so I'm not touching it. <laughs> All right, we need. She must vote unless we approve her stepping out of the uh, reclusing herself. I'm requesting that you don't let make me vote because I'm <laughs> sitting on the very commission that he's applying the grant for. 
Yeah, but think about it like this. Teachers negotiate the government to get uh, their salary. I mean, <laughs> what, what's the difference? Let me ask this question. I agree, with, I agree with you, Pam. Yeah. I'm just being facetious that the teachers <laughs> get to negotiate with the governor about their pay. Why the hell do you care? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm on the my committee that everyone. Well, I'm apologies. on the committee that scores the grants. Last year, I couldn't <laughs> score any grants in Alamance County. They were all excellent, and I'm 100% supportive of this. But I, I can't. I'm not going to vote on it. Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, I move that we excuse Ms. Thompson. Uh, I second. <laughs> Back it up. Just make it hard on you, man. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Okay, that motion carries. And we have a motion on the floor. Thank you. Now. Do we have a we, Do we have a motion and, you and that was your that? motion my second uh, that we pass this grant or approve this grant any discussion all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. all opposed again unanimous thank y'all very much thank you <coughs> Mr. Albright I know that we have a public speaker uh, because I checked on that during the break uh, and that speaker is will address at least one of them how many speakers do we have one. only one Hi. and is likely uh, I think she was directly involved in some litigation uh, I may be wrong on that and you would be the one to correct me if I'm not uh, what should we if anything respond after her presentation well if if it's a public speaker that has three minutes, there's no need for you to respond to that if it involves the county in ongoing litigation. So, so your, your advice would no be not respond? Yes, that's my recommendation. All right, thank you. And I concur with that. All right. I believe we're ready for the public speaker. Okay. Bruce, not flash it. Oh, there it is. Good afternoon. You're connected to the county commissioner's meeting. If you could state your full name and where you live and then begin your three minutes. Okay. Hey, Tori. Uh, this is Donna Poe. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right. So, again, I'm Donna Poe, and I live at 1907 Quake and Bush Road in Snow Camp. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I will be brief. I know it's been a long meeting for you all. Um, I first want to welcome the new commissioners and welcome back Mr. Carter, and thank you all for your leadership. And thank you for considering our dire concerns for our community with your unanimous approval to advance the small area plan option A for snow camp and a moratorium public hearing to be scheduled on March 1st. Thank you again. I look forward to communicating this to our community members who are going to be very relieved, as I am. As mentioned in the earlier public comments, I'd like to share just briefly again the reality that two of North Carolina's seven mega sites created to attract heavy industry to the state are only about 12 miles from the center of Snow Camp and 14 miles from the Snow Camp quarry and my back door. The Greensboro Randolph and the Chatham Siler City mega sites, you can Google map them when you have time, uh, total 3,300 acres zoned for heavy industrial. That is the reason we are dealing with the mine, which will open the door to asphalt and concrete operations if we do not protect our community with the enforcement of the HIDO as written at all times and implementation of the Snow Camp Small Area Plan. So thank you again, and God bless you all and your leadership in protecting the citizens of Alamance County. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tori. And that is the only speaker, is that correct? That is it. Right. I think we now have the county manager up again. Uh, I have no report today. Right. There being no report, any other comments from the commissioners? About what? Nothing. Is there a motion? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I live oh, beside you. Don't you just love the free press? I'm telling you. I just love it. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Show me a second that motion for Thomas. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Do Thank you, you want to vote on this one? <laughs>
Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on Local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.